We're calling the meeting to order at 6.30. And council members, if you have not placed your bet on when we will adjourn tonight, please find the sheet as it's passed along. Uh, we'd like to welcome our younger members in the audience. Um, we also welcome anybody else as well, but particularly uh, Larry Parnes's journalism class from UMass. And uh, we, this is a different group than your predecessor students uh, observed in the past. That group was only five members. We're now 13 and a different form of government. So uh, thank you for joining us. And when you get bored, please feel free to leave. Um, so we are under a very tight time schedule for the first part of our meeting. We're under a tight time schedule for the whole meeting uh, because we promised that uh, Sean Magano would be out of here at 7.30. And um, so let me just start by saying um, we have a number of announcements, uh, which I'm actually going to wait until later to do because there are so many of them and they are around our listening sessions and our four town meetings and our upcoming uh, budget forum um, and so forth. So without any further ado, uh, we are going to continue our education tonight about major capital projects. And in order to do that, I'm gonna go ahead and call on Mr. Bachman and Sonia and Sean. Thank you. Um, I'm here with Sean Mangano, who is the finance director for the school committee, but for the school department, but also our capital projects manager, and Sonia Aldridge, who is our um, interim uh, finance director and also the comptroller. So last couple meetings, you had presentation from the school department and mm -hmm. from our DPW uh, and fire department and library director about the, t the projects, the, ma the four major projects that we have been talking about for a number of years uh, that uh, the town is grappling with. And you got to see an overview of the need, uh, the status of the projects, and where, um, where we think we're going forward with these. Um, tonight, we want to lay some groundwork in terms of how are we going to pay for these projects. And this is specifically why Sean is here tonight to talk about um, how can we pay for them? At the end of this, this is the beginning of a long conversation that you will, that are gonna, it's gonna revolve around this body because um, we have to come up with a plan to pay and to build and pay for these projects. The four projects being the DPW headquarters, the fire department headquarters, uh, a new school, and a, or, uh, the library. These are the four things that have been identified in the past. And we have to do these projects at the same time meeting our ongoing capital needs. And for an example is continue to work on uh, paving our roads and taking care of our transit infrastructure. This conversation isn't a one night thing or isn't a, a several night thing. It's going to take months. You, I'm sure as we help you understand uh, what the parameters are, you're gonna help us say, understand what information you need to make an informed decision. You're going to want to go out into the community and engage with your constituents to under, hear what they have to say. You're going to have, bring that back and say, what about this, what about that? That's the process that we're going to be, be going through. And I, again, this is a, not a several week project. We're thinking this will take a long time, to take several months for us to, to, do, to go through this. With our goal being in the fall that we will be <coughs> settling on as a community a plan that we feel is um, acceptable to the community at large, but also a plan that is doable and that is affordable. So tonight, um, uh, and one of, those, one of those pieces of that pro process is to have an interactive tool on the website that people can play with on their own and that they can put in their own scenarios and come up with things. So we want it to be a, a, a process that fully engages the public, uh, helps to get you to a place where you each individually feel comfortable articulating uh, where you stand on a, a plan of action, uh, and then that we as a community can move forward. We talk about it uh, as being 
we have to have one plan for the town, and that's what we're moving towards. We're really fortunate that Sean has agreed to take on this really important task. Um, as I've talked to you previously, he has great respect within the community. He's already up to speed on what the needs are, um, and, uh, and I appreciate the superintendent and the school committee agreeing to let us use some of his talents in this process. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so tonight we're going to look at the workbook, the model that we're going to use to project the costs um, of the projects, and that might potentially be something that's interactive on the town website that the community can use as well. And then we're going to go through a little presentation just on sort of where we're at with the process. Um, sorry if I talk mostly this way, sort of the way the microphone's facing. Um, but where we are at with the process, what we know, what we're still working on, um, and next steps. So this is the workbook. Um, presenting Excel spreadsheets is never fun and flashy, so if I move things around too much and it makes you dizzy, let me know. Um, but basically, this workbook is to help estimate the project costs, um, estimate the future debt associated with any of the projects at different borrowing assumptions and different terms, um, estimate the funds available for other capital needs. So after we do all the building projects, theoretically in the future, how much is actually left over to do all the ongoing capital work that the town still needs, uh, estimate the impact of debt exclusions, and run various scenarios related to timing, um, different costs, and different configurations. All of those play a big impact into like what we can afford. So this first sheet is really focused on estimating the project costs. Um, there's a variety of different projects at the top, and I'll go through each one so you can and you'll, you'll understand once I go through them. Uh, so the first piece is sort of the base estimating tool. So we're set row five there, where it says base cost estimate. That's the number we have from some report, and you'll, you'll see in the next, when we get to the PowerPoint, what the source of that information is. But we've got an architect report, our architecture report on pretty much all of these projects, except for the 600 student school that was proposed by uh, the superintendent a few weeks ago. And so that's our base. Um, we have the library, the DPW, the fire station. We've included uh, in column F, uh, new school for 465 students, and then we've also included a reno version, just so you have a, a, the scale. Um, and then if you keep going over, it's kind of cut off, but we've got a, the new 600 student school, and let's see, yeah, we've got the, the new 600 student school. Um, then after that, we have the initial year of construction, and that's important for calculating the cost escalation, because as we've seen from the the first school building project to the second school building study that we did, cost escalation really makes a big impact on the total cost. Um, so that initial year of construction is whatever that estimate is above it, what year was that assuming construction? Then we have years of escalation, which I'll talk about in a second, um, more escalation factors, and then a preliminary, uh, preliminary cost estimate, which will include the cost escalation, and then a net zero premium. So some of these projects, the estimates didn't include net zero, um, in particular, the DPW and the fire station. Uh, the school projects already had net zero built in to their original estimates, and the library, I'm told, is sort of excluded from that, uh, that bylaw. So it's really the DPW and the fire station that will have to estimate some sort of premium. Um, one important thing, as just said at the beginning, these are all draft numbers right now. So nothing is real at this point. We're just, this is the tool when we flush out these numbers and get more, um, more solid on these numbers, we'll come back with official figures. So up at the top, you'll see draft numbers not updated. This is just to go over the tool. Sean, I just want to edit one thing. Mm -hmm. While the library is excluded, in fact, their estimates do include significant uh, sure. energy yeah. saving efforts. Yep. And feel free to ask questions as we go through the spreadsheet because it'll be hard to go back and forth. Um, and then one thing that the Finance Committee recommended was what would be the cost of the half percent for ARP? So I put a line in below just to estimate that as well. Um, for the school projects, it is included because that they're ongoing, so they were able to include that in their cost. So the grouping below, that's sort of in the dark red, orange color. Um, so those are different variables that will affect the cost above that you can play around with. Uh, question. I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I'm interested in finding out whether potential renovations to Crocker Farm to make it available to 600 students, uh, where is that in this cost? 
So it's not there yet, um, but we'll talk about that when we get to the presentation. That's okay. one of the things we're still working on developing. Great, thank you. Um, so the variables, oh, sorry, go ahead. Is there any way to make this little? Yes. Yes. Hi. Should we? Whatever you want to do. Um, so the chart below are the, the variables that you can play around with here. So the first is what do we want to use for cost escalation? So right now I just have 4% plugged in. We might change that to 45 Yeah, it's right um, here, this column here. Uh, so again, we're gonna, we've, I've reached out to an architect um, that we're working with who said 4, 4, 4.5, maybe even as high as 5% is realistic going forward. Um, below that, the net zero premium, I have 10% plugged in right now. It's just a number I've heard thrown around before, but that number we need to um, get more support for. And then projected construction year. So we know some of these projects probably aren't going to be constructed in the year that the architect originally thought they were. So this is where you would say, what year do we think they're going to be built in? And then that will adjust the cost escalation above. So I'll just use the library as an example. If we say that's 2025. Well, then that builds in two years of cost escalation, and there's the factor, and so that's what it would do to the cost. So you can do that with all the projects and play around with the different years and scenarios that way. So that's sort of for the base projects. And so again, for library, DPW, fire station, and the, the two school replacement option, we've got architect reports on those, so we've got pretty good data. Uh, the 600 student school, we have to somehow extrapolate the information we have to estimate what that cost would be because there hasn't been a, a deep study by an architect of that option. Um, so what I did was sort of play around with four different models and still thinking of, do we go with one of these models or take an average of the four, but they all sort of are in the same range. So the first option looks at similar, um, similar size MSBA projects uh, for students over here, 630 for the school, 645 for the school, and what the square footage of, of those buildings were. And then it takes the cost per square foot from the Fort River Feasibility Study um, by the TSKP architects and multiplies it by that square foot cost. So on this first option, it comes out to that total cost for 600 students. Um, the second option, so it does, it just takes the square foot per students from the TKSP. So if you look at how many square feet they're projecting for 465 students, it takes that, um, proportion and multiplies it by 600 students to get a total square footage. Um, so it actually comes out to almost the same square feet as in this first version. It comes out to about 110,000 square feet. And then same thing, you take the square foot cost from uh, their report and you get almost the same number because it's basically the same calculation. Um, the third option was looking at the marginal cost increase from TSKP's report. So they had a 315 student school, they also had a 465 student school. So we looked at what was the sort of that difference, what was the increase in cost per student between that difference. And then we d took that same rate and multiplied it by the difference to get to 600 students. And so under that version, it came out to about 70 million. And then the last one was, we, there was just a good comp uh, that the MSBA had data on for Nelson Elementary School. Um, it was a project where they also spent a lot of money on trying to make it very energy efficient and it was about 600 students as well. So we looked at that comp when it was built, uh, we escalated it to the same year as um, the current, or the project we're looking at, and it came out to about 73.6 million. So they're all sort of in the same ballpark between 70 and 80 million, so we'll probably end up somewhere in that range. And we did the same thing for an, um, this thing for, sorry, that, that's it, we'll, we'll keep going. Um, so that's the cost estimating tool. Uh, the next slide is sort of, I just say, yeah, go ahead. So I think what's really important about this, especially for the press, is that these are numbers that we are putting on a spreadsheet to estimate costs, and anybody can go in there and change those numbers according to new information or anything like that. These are not the costs of the new buildings. This is a, a tool that um, we want the public to be able to engage in, and for the counselors and everybody to, to participate in. So I don't, I don't, don't want it to be taken away that, oh, new school costs X number of dollars. That's not the point of this. This is to show the tool. 
Yeah, and I think our work is we're not going to put out one option. We're going to put out multiple scenarios, and, and then those scenarios will also have versions that you can sort of play with based on each one. So this is sort of the main chart that looks at, all right, we, given the cost of the projects, what year do we want to do them, and how do we want to pay for them? Do we want to pay for them by borrowing um, and using our existing capital money to do it, or do we want to exclude the debt and sort of take it off the books and have it paid separately? And so it's set up so that you can do, you, got the, you can do a couple different things. You can do the fire station, the DPW, and the library, and then it's got two spots for schools. Um, so you could do the two school option, or you could change one of these to the 600 student school and just do one 600 student school as opposed to the two of them and just make the other one zero. Um, you put the year to begin, how many years you want to borrow for. So I'm up here in uh, column B, row, uh, row four. Put the year you're going to begin the project, how many years you want to borrow, what the cost is. Right now it's just a kind of made up number. Um, if there is any grant, so right now it's at zero, um, but if we had a grant, so for the schools we'd have the MSBA for theoretically at least one of them, um, you put that grant percentage in right here and then it reduces the cost that the town would actually have to pay for. Sean, could yeah. you enlarge that and then just go over it a little? Slower? Slower, thank you. <laughs> you gave me a really hard time that I have to I know. Um, so again, so each of the projects are up here. So we'll just look at the first one. So the first one is a new Wildwood. You, put, you can put in what year you want the project to begin, and you can go 2030, 2023, you could do whatever you want. You put in the borrowing years, which most likely is gonna be 30 for most of these projects, but you could change it if you wanted to. The cost of the project, so from that first sheet, whatever you estimated for a total cost, that would come into this uh, cell right here. Then you have, we'll go to this next, the reimbursement rate, so if there is a grant for that project, you would put it in this column right there, what percentage, percentage is the grant. So for the schools and for the library, um, there's potential grant funds out there that will reduce the town cost. And then this right above it would be the net cost to the town after you subtract out the grant funds, which is what the, either the borrowing or the debt exclusion would be based on. And then this, if you choose to exclude the debt, so there's little boxes next to each of these projects. If you uncheck it, it means that you wanna uh, see what it looks like to exclude the debt. If you keep it checked, then it's just part of our general borrowing. So right now this is unchecked. So what that means is it's saying this is how much would be basically added to the average tax bill to exclude this much debt for the year. It's not very much because it's, it's a million dollars, but if it was a full-size project, it would be much more. Um, and if you didn't wanna do this, if you wanted to just pay for it out of the general borrowing, you would just check this box. And you, pro you probably can't see it much. Let me change this number to be a little more noticeable. <clears throat> So if you uncheck this, if you keep your eye on this graph over here, so when you uncheck it, it takes it out because it, that graph over to the right is showing the annual debt payments um, from the town's capital funds, not from a debt exclusion, but from what we have set aside for paying um, debt from capital. If you check it, then it goes back over. And I'll, I'll tell you what this chart means in a second. Um, any questions on sort of these cells and what they do? Dorothy, if you chose not to do a debt exclusion on the school, can you explain that a little bit more slowly? If you chose not to do a debt exclusion. So if you chose not to do a debt exclusion, the debt payments for the schools would just be paid out of the town's funds that they set aside for capital, essentially. So the town sets aside a portion of the tax levy every year. It's 9% this year. It's projected to be 9.5% next year. Um, and so that portion of the tax levy has to pay for all the debt associated with capital and it also has to pay for the ongoing capital needs. So if you're not gonna borrow for a capital project, you're just gonna pay for it with cash, um, it also comes out of that portion of the tax levy. So it's a finite amount, um, it's about five or six million dollars basically, and that amount of money has to cover all the debt payments associated with capital and all the ongoing capital needs. So if you don't, debt ex if you don't exclude this debt, that amount of money has to cover this project as well. So why don't I explain this chart, because that'll help round that out. So what this chart shows, um, these lines show what that amount of money that I was just talking about is. So the portion of the tax levy that's dedicated for capital is uh, these two different lines. So one is looking at 10%, and one is looking at, I think, 
uh, 9%. So we're at 9% now. The goal is to get to 10%. So it just shows the difference. If we can get to 10%, how much more money is available to pay for capital. So this is sort of our upper ceiling. If we're going to try to fund all these projects, staying within that portion of the tax levy, that 9 or 10%, we have to stay under this line. If we go over this line, we have to find another way to pay for it. So it's either going to have to come from the operating budget or from some other source of funds. And then these bars underneath show the debt. So the first um, set of bars here, this dark green, this is all the existing debt the town has. Um, it's running out, which is good. You've all heard that the town is in pretty good position with its debt, and so you can see it's winding down, um, projected to go away completely in 2026. Um, but this is the existing debt that's already coming out of that, that portion of the tax levy. Then there's a placeholder for new debt. So there's some specific projects that are sort of on the radar that have been factored in going forward. And there's also a placeholder for regional school district debt um, that the town has its share of the assessment from the regional school district. Um, so that's factored in. So you see this yellow piece going on in perpetuity because of that. And then the rest of the bars are related to those specific projects on the left. So the dark blue would be the debt payments from Wildwood. Um, the red would be the debt payments from the fire station. Um, this green is if there was a Fort River uh, project. The gray would be DPW. And not on here yet because it's not checked as um, the library. And again, these are not numbers to like gasp at because they're not real numbers yet. It's not a real scenario, but just so you can see um, sort of how it works. So in this, you know, if this scenario happened and we did all these projects that specific way, we would go over that amount. Um, so we'd have to do some work to get it under that line. Does that make sense, what this chart is showing? Are there questions? Yes, about this. Yes, Kathy. Um, I think the answer is yes, but Mike, question is you've got a base assumption of what we're going to be spending on everything else, you know, as you, you look through these lines. So if you said um, on roads, for example, that we want to spend $800,000 a year each of this, it reduces the amount that is left for the big projects. Is that a correct way of, uh, you know, I know you could right. do it interactively to show us this line comes down. Yeah, so that's one thing we're still thinking about how to show. So right now in this chart, there's no amount in there for ongoing capital needs. So really, you don't want to be up against that line. You want to be a healthy amount underneath that line so that there's money left for the ongoing capital needs. Um, this chart below, which I put together quickly, I'm going to make it a little smaller. So this shows how much is available for other capital projects. So aside from those four big building projects, this is how much would be left over to do all the other ongoing capital needs for the town. So before the, school, the building projects go into effect, we'd have this much money available. Once it goes into effect, as you saw above, it goes above that tax levy line, so it actually puts us into a negative area. But essentially, it shows that there's nothing available for other capital projects. That literally means it, nothing, like nothing. no repairs on a building. Right. No, and, yeah. Um, right. so, we're, so when we put together scenarios, we're going to factor that in of what we think would be a reasonable estimate of what do we have to have set aside for roads, for school buses, for police cars, fire trucks, things like that. So again, that's not factored in yet, but that's going to be part of, uh, it's in the, the PowerPoint we'll talk about in a second, and um, it's going to be crucial that we keep that in mind. Yeah. So the other part I spoke about a little bit, which is really important, is so this debt per um, debt exclusion impact per household average and the high. So if we exclude the Wildwood debt, so it takes it out of the right because it's no longer coming up from the chart because it's no longer coming out of that allocation um, of the tax levy for capital. It's coming out of a new source of revenue from taxpayers. Um, and this shows what the impact is on the taxpayer. So on the average um, household, which I think is 300 and it's on this next slide. Uh, what is it? It's uh, 354,000 right now. So on the average household of 354,000, um, the average impact of the debt exclusion for 30 years um, would be 128, and the high would be 181, which would be in the first year, and it would go down slowly over the course of the 30 years. But at that, excuse me. But at that point, we still haven't gotten ourselves under the line. 
Right, we're still not under the line. Yep. Okay. So again, that's why I mentioned, so playing around with the years is gonna be really important because we're gonna have to sort of space these projects out as best we can, um, understanding that there's a need to do all of them. Um, and also the cost is a big piece. We're gonna have to try to get the cost down as best we can on all the projects and um, grant funds. I think all those things are coming to play when you have you know, this magnitude of um, new construction that we're looking at or, or renovation. So does this, so this is the main slide that we thought we would somehow make available to the public to play around with because most of the information that you would need other than maybe some instructions is available. We'd clean it up a little bit um, and protect some stuff, but basically allow people to change these inputs and see what it does to the, the chart on the right. I have a question about the, for example, under the purple one in the library where you have it costing, for example, 35,000. Mm -hmm. And then in the box to the right, you have 22,450,000. 22, what is that number again? So this would be, and again, I don't know if these, this number, I haven't checked in a, a little bit, but that would be if, if we had a grant that reimbursed roughly 36%, um, what would the town's cost be? So, I see. So okay. those are two pieces we'll have to put. So but the library is a little different because there's a grant they're looking at, but there's also some private fundraising. Um, so we'll have to look at how we label that. Um, with the schools, it's a little more straightforward. It's really whatever the MSBA reimbursement rate is, which is another variable we have to nail down. Um, but that's what those would be. It would be what portion is being paid by a grant or another source of funds. Dorothy? Again, this is a basic question. You have down Wildwood School and Fort River School. Mm -hmm. But the plan that we have before us is for one school. So how do I relate that chart to this? Um, it's a good question. Uh, so we could do a couple things. Either we could add another um, box, basically, down below that was a 600-student new school. Um, and if you go with that option, you would just make those two zero. Uh, that's probably what we'll end up doing um, to make it the simplest. This is a model in progress. It's in progress. Other questions at this point? Okay. So now that you all memorize this and can explain everything e easily, <laughs> we want to do a presentation on, uh, and this is a presentation that we have done with the Finance Committee, and a lot of the material you're getting, will, we will always preview with the Finance Committee in advance to get their feedback and then pre present it to you for additional feedback. So. All right, so I just wanted to sort of recap what information we have available right now and what information we're still in the process of gathering. Um, so as I said before, all the projects, basically we have um, a semi-recent report from an architect that's estimated the project cost, which is really helpful. Um, so the library, we have a report from Fenison Consulting who used somebody else as the architect, but they, they were the consulting group. Um, we have a report from Kessel Booz for the fire station. Uh, the DPW, we have a report from Weston Sampson and for Fort River TSKP Studio. Um, again, of these three, the only one that I sort of specifically included the net zero bylaw um, as it was passed was the Fort River project. The library may, I'm not sure the timing of that one was, but um, Fort River, we know that's built in. Um, this is a little bit new from what the Finance Committee has seen, so it's updated a little bit. Um, we also now, we've Work, uh, connected with the town's financial advisor from Unibank um, to get what we should use as a projected interest rate going forward. And that's what we were assuming anyway, but he confirmed that 5% is a good number to use sort of in the future as a, as a borrowing rate. And then cost escalation, as I mentioned, um, I spoke with an architect that we're working with at the region um, who said between four or four and a half percent and could be as high as 5%. Um, and it's, I confirmed it by looking at um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics and looking at cost escalation for new school constructions the last couple of years, and it's been about four and a half percent. So there's a lot of information that we still need. Uh, so again, net zero cost for the DPW and the fire station. Uh, we need the cost of the new 600 student school, which we're estimating, but the piece that you haven't seen a, an estimate for yet is the cost to build an addition at Crocker Farm um, or the cost to renovate the middle school to take sixth grade. 
So the, the cost to renovate the middle school to take sixth grade, we'll have a firm number, well, quasi-firm number from an architect relatively soon. That's one of the things that JCJ is looking at for the region, looking at different scenarios, and that's one of the scenarios that they're gonna give us um, information on. Uh, the other one, we don't have anybody looking at that right now, so we'll have to be creative in how we estimate that cost. Um, we don't know exactly what the grade configuration would look like um, under that scenario, so it, again, that's, we'll have to be sort of conservative when we estimate that. Um, and then there's also been requests from various people about sort of the operating cost impact of this. So what would be the cost of operating um, a new 600 student school? You have one fewer building. Would there be savings from having one fewer building? Um, would there be a financial impact if you know, we were, if the sixth grade was at the middle school? Would there have to be some sort of agreement with the regional school committee to house students there? Um, impact on bus transportation, you have fewer buildings, so maybe the buses can be more efficient, but maybe they have to drive more miles, so all that stuff we have to look at still. Uh, other stuff, so the debt exclusion, so you know, we'll have some scenarios, but ultimately what projects will have their debt excluded and how much should be excluded. Uh, swing space costs, so the schools could potentially have swing space costs, but I think we also heard from the library that they might need temporary space while their, their project's going on. Um, on the positive side, you know, if we do have new school buildings, I think there's quite a bit on the capital plan that could potentially be pulled off. So the town has a 10-year capital plan that has, I know for the schools, has a roof for Fort River and new windows for one of the buildings. Some of those things can be pulled off the capital plan if a new school building is going to be um, constructed in the near future. And that, I assume that's true with all the projects that are going on. Uh, impact on capital and operating funds from increased debt level. So we talked about this a little bit already. If, if the debt levels rise significantly from the new building projects, that means there's going to be less money left over for other capital projects. And depending on what the needs are, that could also sort of eat into the operating budget because if we really need to do another capital project but there's no more capital money left, um, really the only, only other place it could come from is the operating side. And then a really big one that um, I've reached out to the architect, uh, TSKP, about is uh, MSBA reimbursement rate. So we've got the reimbursement rate from the, the original school building project from a few years ago, but that was before net zero. And I don't know how much, if any, of the net zero sort of premium that was added on to this new building will be reimbursable by the MSBA. So we've asked them to sort of analyze you know, the, the estimates they've put together and give us what they think the effective reimbursement rate would be. So there, there's two reimbursement rates. There's sort of like your stated rate, which will be a high number. And then there's the effective rate, which will be a much lower number. And it's because the MSBA doesn't reimburse for everything. And so they'll give you the stated rate. But then when you apply that to what's actually eligible, it'll be lower. Um, so we're asking them to help us with that number. So to try to make this simple, what we're planning on doing is proposing four scenarios for you all, at least initially. Um, and each of these scenarios could have different wrinkles. Uh, so the first option that we're planning to look at is basically a new fire station, DPW, library, Fort River, and Wildwood. So that's sort of a baseline. What if we just replace both schools as they are now? What would that look like? Um, within this option, you could have one of the schools debt excluded, one of the schools not debt excluded. Um, they could both be MSBA projects. It would affect the timing. So there, there's definitely different wrinkles within each option, but that's sort of the, the general option would be looking at those, that configuration. Option two would be the same as option one, but instead of new schools, it would be ad renos um, for Fort, R Fort River and Wildwood, so it would be a little less expensive. Option three would be the, the first three buildings would still be new, and then we'd look at a new 600-student school with an addition at Crocker Farm, and then the last one's the same thing, except for instead of the addition at Crocker Farm, it would be the sixth grade moves to the middle school. Questions on these four options? Yeah. The the issue option two, my understanding of the Massachusetts School Building Authority is that they would only pay for part of an addition. They would not pay for renovation of a, at this point, of those buildings. Is that correct? Um, I would have to check with the Fort River Feasibility Group and, and Dr. Morris. Okay. Um, I haven't heard that specifically, but there might be something that. Okay. Yeah. I think it's a, it's more of an MSBA issue okay. than it is the building committee. Okay. It, it it directly impacts your statement that those might be less expensive. Right. Because the amount of state money 
we might be able to get for right. those is dra I, I understand it to be drastically reduced. Yeah, that's a good point. My statement was mainly the total cost, but you're right, the net cost to the right. town, if, if that's um, the case, then that the net cost of the town might be lower, or it might right. be higher. Yeah. Um, when you set this up, if I go through the first three things, fire station, DPW, and library, will it be set up in a way that I could put a different number in and then the initial number? You know, in other words, this is a new and proposed, suppose to, it was. Right, to try and price out the, like, the different options. Uh, yeah, we'll try to set it up to be as flexible as possible. Yep. Okay. Uh, I have some questions over here. Mandy Jo? Oh, I'm sorry, Shalini. In, does the renovation of Fort River and Wildwood accommodate the open classroom problem? I believe it addresses the open classroom issue. I mean, Dr. Morris would have to speak to that a little bit more because I haven't been directly connected with the Fort River feasibility study, but I believe, so the ad reno here is based on the Fort River feasibility group looked at, I think, six different options, A, B, C, D, and E, and a code update. Um, and so these specific options would be looking at the complete new construction and then they had different levels of addition and renovation. Um, and so it was looking at one of the, the smaller addition options. So it would have a small addition and be primarily renovation. Andy. Uh, one additional cost factor for options one and two is that it would seem unlikely that MSBA would um, allow SOIs into the process for two different schools in the same town at the, at the same point. And therefore, um, not only do we have the educational problems of whatever the second school is, but their cost factors <coughs> with um, the additional construction cost for the second school that's built just because of the time and uh, the need to do capital work to maintain that school during the interim period. And uh, I was wondering how that kind of thought process gets factored in. Yeah, I know that's a good point. So none of these options make any assumptions around timing of these projects. So again, that's why I said there's a lot of wrinkles within each of this, these options. So option one, for example, you know, there, there is a way to do the two schools with MSBA funds, I think. It would just, they'd have to be spaced out quite a bit more than what I think a lot of people would like. Um, but so that'll be a different scenario. So we can show one where we have MSBA project for Fort River, for example, and we do a debt exclusion for Wildwood so that they can both be done in a, in a closer timeline. But you could also play around with the, with the model and say, well, what if we did Fort River now and Wildwood in the future and we assume the MSBA funds for both of them? Um, again, we've, we've talked about that at the school committee level. It's just that, that there's a much larger gap of time between the buildings and that's difficult to have two schools out of the exact same, have similar issues being addressed, you know, that far apart. But that, that's a good point that I should clarify again. None of these options make assumptions around timing. That would be, again, some of the things that we have to play around with to make the, the cost work, quite frankly, to, so it's affordable, um, and just to provide the information that you're requesting. Are there other questions? Oh, it, okay, would you like to go back a slide? A uh, couple more. Okay, all right, why don't we finish the slides and then we'll go back. Um, so, it's probably what helped with the last question. So, um, with those scenarios, just other considerations. So again, the order and timing of the projects, all those options, we would have to play around with the order and timing, whether the fire station goes first or last or whatever. Um, you know, some of the timing is driven by when the schools get into the MSBA and when the library funding comes around. So there's lots of, uh, of considerations and things that aren't known right now about the timing of when the projects would be done. Um, so we have to make some assumptions around that. Uh, space availability, um, in particular with the fire station DPW, that sort of domino effect. Um, and as I said, acceptance of the MSBA and other grant programs. Um, so next steps. Uh, so on the town side, we're going to gather the information or as much of it as we can, um, and we're going to provide some cost estimates for the different options. Again, it's going to be very high-level cost estimates because we're so, you know, far removed from these projects and, and architects aren't looking at these specific models. Um, and then sort of on the finance committee town council side, um, you know, meeting with you again in the future and, and just continuing to adapt these models based on your feedback as we go forward. 
Now I'm done. Okay, me and Dijo. I have two questions, one of which might have some sub-questions to it. The first one is um, related to our reserves. It, I didn't see in the workbook you were using any impact of potentially using reserves in there. Has there been a thought of using them? And if so, how much of the reserves and how can we factor that into the tool to right. play with? So this tool does allow um, there. So if you look at like this little, these little yellow lines you see up here, they're hard to see. Um, but it does allow for if we were to put a steady contribution into the stabilization fund, um, theoretically a capital stabilization fund, it does allow for taking some of that out. Um, so for the years that we do go over the line, if, if it wasn't a lot, we could potentially start setting aside money now to fund some of those years in the future where we know we're gonna go over um, the amount set aside for capital. So what these, this shows is, based on the model here, this model I think assumes contributions of about 500,000 into cap, capital stabilization each, each year leading up to it. And then it applies it um, in some sort of order. It applies it going forward. So basically, if we do set aside 500,000, we could afford up to this level um, going forward. But as you can see, the bars still go above that in this sort of made up model. But it, so it does allow for that. We can play around with, the, um, and it probably does make a lot of sense to try to use some of our <laughs> reserves and set aside money as best we can to pay for some of these projects. My, my yes. next question is, you know, this is working with numbers we're being given. I'm curious, given our, our credit rating, what's like the maximum we can borrow um, <laughs> at all? You know, is there a maximum there? Is there a max, I mean, I know there's a maximum for how much we have within a capital budget, but is there a maximum even with debt overrides of what the creditors would allow us to borrow? And then th the related question to that is, you know, that's a maximum for total, but are, you know, as it is, these are numbers given to us. Do we have any say in, hey, this project really can't go over this number and you have to figure out a way to get under that number no matter what they're handing to us? Let's start with the first question. And I, is that more of a Sonia question? Sure. I can answer the debt limit. Um, inside the debt limit, we have about $100, $100 million of debt capacity to borrow. Whether we can afford to pay Back a hundred million dollars is another question. Okay. Is there any other comment on the debt issue? Okay. And then your second question was was just about project costs. How much do we, as a council, have okay. in terms of setting a number for each of the projects versus right. the projects coming to us with a number? Well, ultimately, I think anything that's borrowed, you'll have to authorize the debt. So you'll have you'll definitely have to say when it comes to that. Right. Um, yeah. There's. Can, can I, I I just want to see whether what Mandy was asking is suppose we said we think we can have for DPW twenty million. What can you do for twenty million? You know, so so like we wouldn't want to pick a number out of the air, but but say, okay, this was where you came in, but what if the most is that? Yeah. What, what you, yeah, so I think that that's, we're anticipating that, that we're, there's going to be both the cost, the, the payment and the, the cost containment. We have to look at both of those angles when we look at this. A lot of times when architects design, they design to the, what you say you want, and sometimes your wants exceeds what you can afford. So now we have to pull back what we want to recognize maybe we can't afford everything we want, so maybe we can phase it in or prepare for what we want eventually, but we can phase it in or we just don't get what everything we want. So I think that that's, that's part of this conversation as well. Right. It's not just how we pay for whatever it costs. It's also you have to look at the expense side as well. Let, We're prepared to do that. Let me give you just an example because of my experience with DBW and fire. Right now, the feasibility study for the fire station includes a community room, which would also be used as a training room, which would be a nice asset to have in, in South Amherst. But maybe we can't afford that. And that's an example of one of the questions that has to get raised. Are there other questions of Sean? 
before I open it for public comment. Okay. Um, Sean, can you bear with us for just a minute, another minute or two? Do we have anybody in the audience who would like to make public comment on this particular issue? We will do a general public comment after Sean leaves. Okay. Are there questions? Andy. I was just wondering if it would be helpful um, if, I, I don't know if m any of my fellow counselors uh, need a little bit of help with something, because you talked about a debt um, capacity, um, Sonia, and then we've used the term debt exclusion, and I'm not sure that those terms are fully understood, and uh, well, I think I do understand them. I was wondering if um, it would be helpful to do that for other people. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not a treasurer, but I'll try. <laughs> um, debt capacity, we can um, borrow up to 5% of our EQV for debt, and that's debt capacity. It's about $119 million, and with our outstanding debt, it's about $100 million that we can borrow, so that was a rounding figure. That's and the EQV is property values, right? Yeah. Yes, Explain you, EQV. I get that Thank all the you. time, so now I'm going to do it to you. Thank you. Um, so you all lost my train of thought now. Thanks. Uh, so that's all inside the debt limit. Outside the debt limit is over and above that capacity. Um, I think it's all going to come down to how much we can afford to borrow inside and outside, how much taxpayers can afford. And so can, so uh, um, under Proposition 2.5, we can only increase our taxes by 2.5% globally through the town. It doesn't mean each individual tax bill goes up 2.5%. It means we can raise um, whatever we're raising this year plus 2.5%. And so, um, and that's to pay for everything. Plus, we can have new growth, which are new buildings that come <coughs> online, uh, new um, whatever it is that, that can increase our, our um, money coming in. So this is all about money coming in. If the taxpayers agree, if you first agree to put a question on the ballot and then the taxpayers agree, they are, what they are saying is that we'll pay our 2.5% increase, plus we're willing to pay more because we think this project is really partic in particular is very important to us. And they're willing to pay more for the, the life of that debt only. There are two types of, over, of debt, ex there's a debt exclusion and then there's the override. The debt exclusion just pays off the debt, so if the, um, the DPW, the voters say, we want to exclude that debt. We would increase our taxes by $200. I'm making up numbers here, $200 a year for the next 30 years to pay off that. And we agree to do that over and above what we can do under Proposition 2.5. Contrast that with a general operating override, which says the voters say, wow, we can't really get everything we want within the limits of Proposition 2.5, so we're going to increase our, um, the money we're paying for taxes every year forever by $200 or whatever it is. And that's an operating override, and that stays forever. It builds up our, our base of money coming in from the taxpayers. Typically, this ta well, our neighboring community has done an a, um, operating override um, in the past, this town I don't think has ever done an operating override. It has, hasn't done for a while. Um, you did a while back, right? Andy would know, obviously, but um, <laughs> uh, but it is um, not irrational to ask for debt exclusions. And the logic on that is that uh, when you're limited to two and a half, and if the inflation is higher than that, it's it's the argument can be made to the taxpayers to say we'll live within the limits of Proposition two and a half. But when we need something above that, we're going to come to you, ask for your permission to tax higher than that. So that's the logic on that. Mindy Jo. So if our borrowing limit, whether or not we override to pay that back that borrowing, is about $100 million, I think if you go back to the previous workbook there, the projected costs are well over that. Is that right? I, I don't know all the numbers in my head. It sounds right, if I can find the yeah. mouse. No, it is. It's about 100 and... Right. 
60. So we don't plan, I mean, you're right, that's gonna be a uh, concern. We, we aren't gonna borrow all this at once. Um, so, but it's something we're gonna have to monitor. So is there a way to put that sort of maximum of 100 million or whatever the maximum borrowing is, some line somewhere on yeah. that? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good a idea, yeah. Um, one other thing, I wondered if on the chart, which is the next page, there is a way to take the yellow line, or maybe it's an additional piece, that really reflects much more an average of what we need to be paying each year for general um, maintenance of roads, et cetera. I, I mean, I, I'm very concerned that we could become <laughs> building rich and have dirt roads, um, and I don't think we want that. So it's trying to look at the whole capital. Yeah, yeah we'll try to build that into this chart so that's all in one piece. Yeah. Other questions at this time? Yes, Darcy. I just wondered if this chart, this tool is available to us now to look at anywhere. It's, it's not quite ready. Um, I think pretty soon. Um, I think we want to get some of the, the base variables solid first. And once we do that, we'll work on trying to make it available to you. Um, so I would say in, within a couple of weeks, hopefully, that it's in that place. Other questions? Okay, and no audience comment at this point on this? Thank you. You're gonna get out of here Thank you. nine <laughs> minutes early. I actually am gonna just, Margaret, go back to uh, the beginning of the agenda. I wanted to make sure we had plenty of time for Sean, and so we kind of did things in a slightly different order. Um, I do wanna mention now in the announcements that we have a very intense two-week period coming up. Uh, it includes six listening sessions with the schools. Not only will there be school committee members at those, but there will be counselors at least two at every one of those, and in many instances, several more. Uh, counselors are there to listen, um, to hear what the public has to say, and we hope that you that are in the audience and also listening at home will also come out for those uh, facilitated listening sessions that are being held conducted by the schools and by their uh, external facilitator. Um, we also have a four towns meeting. Uh, Andy Steinberg has been working very diligently over the last several months with the other three towns to come up with the formula for the regional schools. And uh, this is a point at which we will be looking at that. And you'll see Sean again, because that's part of his job. And uh, Andy may have some more to say about that later. And then also we wanna make sure that people are aware we are doing a public forum on the town budget. Uh, that will be on Thursday, March 7th at 6.30 at the Amherst Regional Middle School. So there's plenty of room. Uh, and uh, we hope that it, again, people will join us. That will be called as a regular council meeting or as a special council meeting, excuse me. But again, the real goal is, and the requirement is, that it's a time to hear from the public. So half of that time will be spent in public comment. So I'd like to go to general public comment. If there's an item that is not later on in the agenda, for example, the public ways issues for the farmer's market, et cetera, this is the time for general public comment. Is there anybody that wishes to speak? in about an issue not on the agenda later on. If not, then we'll continue right on. Uh, we have no hearings and we're going on to action item six. Um, and let me just mention this is again in part uh, our responsibilities to act, but for this council it is also an opportunity to learn. Uh, we are the keeper of the public way. 
that means the roads and the parking lots, et cetera, et cetera. And in that responsibility, uh, we need to provide for a special requests to the town uh, that people and different groups make for the use of the public way. And we have three of those before us tonight. I will just give you a heads up right now that when it comes to the Amherst Half Marathon and 5K Road Race, I will be recusing myself because it benefits the Amherst Survival Center, of which I'm still on the board, and Mandy Joe will be taking over as chair, as president for that time. Um, and then at the end of this conversation, um, we will be looking at a memorandum from uh, the town manager that we would then ask, I would ask that we refer to the Governance Organization and Legislation Committee because it really is suggesting uh, some ways in which uh, Mr. Bachelman believes that we might want to consider looking at requests for public way um, in the future. But this is the first time we've dealt with public way, except for our experienced previous um, select board members. And our first one is the Amherst Farmers Market. And I believe we have someone who would like to speak to that. Please come forward, identify yourself. First of all, I'd like to thank you for having us here to speak. Um, my name is David Mahowski, and I'm speaking for the Farmer's Market. And I believe this is our 48th year that we're up in front of some governing body asking for our, the space again. So thank you very much. Wow. Um, I'm ha happy to answer questions, but we're, again, um, probably in summation, it's best to say that the Amherst Farmer's Market, if you're not familiar with it, is going into its 48th year. And we're one of the oldest, largest, and longest standing farmer's markets in the state. And I think we have a really nice representation for both the town of Amherst and communities as far as Brookfield and New Braintree, Pittsfield, where vendors are coming in to display their wares. Um, it's been a very successful market and we're growing. And I guess one thing I would like to say that's kind of a new addition for this year and for the next three years actually is we have a new partnership with um, Blue Cross Blue Shield getting involved with their healthy incentive, healthy, healthy dietary, healthy plan, healthy lifestyle sort of entity that they're partnering up with us. They've given us a very nice grant that's going to be allowing us to have some new um, capabilities to reach out to different and new members of the community, hopefully. Um, we hope that our expanse is kind of going out in concentric circles and we're gonna be able to spend more time and more energies and more efforts to do so. Um, with or without that, we have had historically, on average, on a good market day, between 3,000, 3,600, 4,200 are the numbers that I got back from Don Marion, who was at, at Extension Services at UMass, in terms of foot traffic. So we draw in quite a hub of um, activity on Saturdays. And we historically have run April through November, latter part of April through November. Um, up to the weekend before Thanksgiving. So it's on average 30, 31 weeks. And um, we have used the Spring Street parking lot and part of Boltwood Avenue in front of the Lord Jeff as our L-shaped farmer's market for the community. And we're asking for that, I guess, for year number 48 to continue the tradition going. Okay. Yes, are there questions? Alyssa. Just to move this along a little for the town council's benefit, normally at this point we would ask, are there any changes from previous years? That's the, because we have been doing it for a very long time. And some years there are tweaks and other years it's just the same thing. Okay. Are there any changes? This year we're tweak free. We're just going <laughs> to keep up the momentum hopefully and have a little growth. We've had a very good run and good. it's been I would have to say successful, partly due to the town's support. We've had a very nice atmosphere, element, and governance in providing what we can for the town, and it's very good for the local growers. So, great. No tweaks are in are in place. Right, Andy. Yeah, uh, being the other former select board <clears throat> member who's here, um, an issue that we had raised um, for a number of years on the board, well before I became a member. 2014 and 
um, I took up the issue and to, when I was elected on behalf of the, our local farmers is that there was a concern that there wasn't sufficient outreach and sufficient opportunity for um, our local growers and local food producers to participate in the market on an equal basis with other farmers. And while we have great respect and appreciation for farmers who have come for many years to support the supply side of the market, um, we also, um, as a community that believes very much in our agricultural history, want to support our local farmers. So um, I was wondering if you have any comment, um, observations about recent efforts that have been made on outreach to Amherst farmers and producers about their ability to participate in efforts to get them involved on a um, equal basis with um, other uh, vendors at the market. Well, luckily, a recent tweak, if you will, adding the Boltwood Avenue extension for the market which I believe happened four or five years ago, has enabled us to not have to turn anybody away. So if somebody's a local grower, and if they're coming to us and they fulfill the bylaws of the market, um, we have space for them now. So we're full, but we have elbow room, and I have people coming at me to get involved. It's been successful enough that there's this momentum of people that are coming and approaching the market and as, again, as long as they fulfill the requirements that they are a local grower, they are a local producer, that they're not buying and selling or not uh, a wholesale wholesaler, um, we can welcome them with open arms. We have the space to do so, which is really nice. So I guess I'll just, um, I'm probably going to leave it with the Agricultural Commission in town in the, um, over the next um, period to see if they have any concerns. I don't think that it... Um, going to affect how I support the market this year. Um, but um, I, uh, the one comment that I do, um, heard from some growers is that if they're, uh, why I use the term equal opportunity for placement and uh, participation is that uh, that is a factor in how well apparently people are doing in the market. But anyway, thank you. Mandy Joe. So this question might be more of a town manager's question. Um, but as I was reading the application, um, I noticed there was no listing for a fee being charged for some of these uses. And I recognize there's about 50 parking spots that are going to be taken up by the farmer's market. And we have been dealing with parking issues in this town. and. 3,000 patrons coming in is fantastic, but we're losing 50 spots for some of them to park. So I guess my question is, do we as the town charge anything for 31 weeks of use and blocking off of the Spring Street lot for five hours? Um, and Which is why I say it might be more for a town manager um, response. And if we don't, could, could I ask, why we might not charge even a minimal fee? It's actually about 40 spots total. Yeah, not, not quite 50, but 40. Mr. Bachman. So I, we don't charge a fee, um, and it, the town has never charged a fee for it. If, if the council would like to entertain that, that's something up to you. You're, you're the, the controller of the public way. So could, could I, we do charge a fee for pavilion rental at the parks, right? Yes. I would like to make one other note on this. On the application in the, in the letter, they had asked for five spaces on South Pleasant Street. Um, previously, the select board had granted two spaces. So what's before you and in the motion is for two spaces on South Pleasant Street. Those are the ones all the way to the left um, to, to comply with what the select board voted last year. And I've talked with Mr. Mahowski and he's fine with that as well. <coughs> And the only other thing I want to point out is if you see on the map, there are these two blue dots on the right, which have a lines that go to the Lord Jeff. Mm -hmm. And we have a companion motion in your, on your motion sheet that gives them permission to use those 
because we are taking their normal drop-off area away from them during the course of the, um, the farmer's market. So we, we provide those two parking spaces to the Lord Jeff uh, for exclusive use during the time the farmer's market is open. Dorothy. Um, I want to comment that the Amherst, is this thing on right here? That the Amherst Farmer's Market is, is a very vital part of the town and that uh, my daughter and uh, son-in-law found it very useful um, in growing their business, um, the kitchen garden farm. Mm -hmm. And um, they don't do farmer's markets now, but it was, I think, an essential part of the increasing, I think, agricultural presence of the area mm -hmm. to have this great market. Um, the question of, of uh, who you let in and how many, um, the committee has to, uh, that runs the market does have to balance that with having a varied market so that people have a chance to uh, make some money when they bring all their food there. So you can't have too many of the same thing at the same time. Right. So it's, it's a very complex process, I just wanted to say. Yes. Yes, Pat. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, I'm going back to the Blue Cross Blue Shield grant. Mm -hmm. um, I know other farmer market, farmers markets uh, provide, give more dollar value to food stamps and things. Mm -hmm. So are those some of the things? Could you tell me what you're thinking about providing for people yeah, with actually, that grant? Yeah, actually it's a huge increase for what we can do with those that are disadvantaged or using SNAP or EBT. If you're familiar with the, uh, the HIP program, the Healthy Incentive Program, which is a supplemental benefit for those that are getting SNAP benefits. It has varied over the years with monies that they've had for a cash influx. And the first three years they had the HIP program, they used up all of the monies allocated, I think in a year and two months, something like that. It went, it went away very quickly. Um, what we're planning to do with the Blue Cross Blue Shield money is 80% of it's gonna go towards a direct cash influx, using it for those people that have SNAP benefits already. We're gonna allow them access to 80% of the monies on a monthly allocation to use it for shopping at the market. So it's gonna be a quite a nice addition for the local community. And again, with that, it's gonna partner into the, re the, uh, the reaching out that we're gonna be doing for various elements of the community to try to get more, more access to the market. And you know, we're fortunate enough that granted parking might be an issue, as you'd mentioned at times, but we're right on a bus line, right on the 33, the 35, the 31. I think, you know, there are extensive numbers of buses that basically drop people off right at one end of the market. So it's, it's not too difficult to actually get to the market and literally fall into it. So accessibility is pretty, uh, it's pretty fortuitous for us. Um, of course, Pat, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering uh, whether or not uh, farmers who are selling at the market at the end of the day or are there donations made to um, any of the food programs in town or the food bank or not bread alone or anything like that? I, I can't speak for the vendors and what they do at the end of the market. Uh, most of the market vendors do multiple markets. So at the end of closing day on Saturday, they're on to a Monday market, Tuesday, et cetera. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure some of them do. You know, they repurpose stuff or it goes back for compost. It's not wasted, but it varies depending on the vendor. I'm sure. So. Alyssa. Mr. Steinberg can speak to this more specifically if somebody else has a question about it, but I want to emphasize with it, based on a comment earlier about not having too much of the same thing and the need to balance, that is true, and they also accept all Amherst producers, even if they want to sell exactly the same thing that the booth next to them sells, because we insisted on that as throughout the process that was worked on some years ago, because Amherst producers were being told that their work was duplicative and therefore there was no room for them. And we said, we're not charging you for the use of these spaces. You will include Amherst producers. And it was nicer than that, but that was basically the bottom line. And it all worked out and everybody, everybody's happy. And so that's really good. It is in fact true as we go through these other items that traditionally for events on the common, we do not charge for parking. So Big Brothers, Big Sisters Craft Fair, Taste of Amherst, et cetera, we do not not say we don't charge for some things and we certainly do charge for things like when people use spaces because they're doing an office clean out or an office move. But for the big events that draw people downtown, our tradition has been we do not mm -hmm. charge for the booking of those spaces even though obviously it takes a lot of spaces out of commission. Okay. Mr. Steinberg? 
No. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, Andy. I, I want to add one more comment about local farmers because uh, Pat and I represent a district that has several farms, District 2, and various other councillors represent other districts. And we hear from them that the farmer's market has basically uh, negated some of the popularity or use, if you will, of farm stands. And so as we look at this and we look with agriculture, the Committee on Agriculture, I just think that needs to be brought into consideration and how some of those farm stands might be made to feel more welcome to come to farmer's market. I think historically, I've seen a lot of the vendors that have been at the market go out and open their farm stands. Yeah. So in a sense, the farm stands have been a bit of a draw away from the market. It hasn't gone right. the other way where they start to stand and then come in. Yeah. They start at the market, right. they grow big, um, and then move out. Um, a recent one was um, Jeremy Plotkin, who has his simple you know, gifts. You know, right. has simple gifts. Yeah. You know, he's at the market for 18 years okay. and essentially got, I think it's fair to say, he got bigger than what the market could provide. Um, Jeremy's a wonderful guy. Welcome back, too. Right. We have a spot for him if he wants to sell at the farm stand right. and come to the market. I don't know if it's you know financially viable for him to do both, mm -hmm. but space is there waiting for him right. if he'd like to do so, which I've, I've expressly told mm -hmm. him, actually. So. Okay. Uh, yes, Sarah. So I just wanted to say, because it was brought up and made a statement by someone on the council, that... Um, Everyone is happy with the way um, things are with the market right now. And I would just like to say, I, I think the select board did an amazing job in um, bringing in, you know, making sure that all Amherst farmers were welcome in, that that, that wasn't always the way that it was. So I, I really like to say that was fabulous. But I just like to say that there are, there are different ways to maybe not make someone feel welcome or maybe to, to change things to make everyone feel welcome and to make it equal playing field. So I think that like Andy said, like, you know, maybe, you know, with AgCom, maybe if they're, I know that there are some issues that farmers have, just I know you've always, you know, usually come and talk to them. So that might be something um, you guys could tweak during the year. Um, <clears throat> you may not be aware of this, but I'm actually part of that on the Agricultural Commission. So there is, there is a conduit between What's going on with the commission? Yeah, I was. Yeah, yeah I'm. I'm, I'm yeah. acknowledging that. Mm -hmm. I was also on AgCom, and I know that you guys mm -hmm. do. Any other comments, questions? Any other comment from the audience on this, please? I just wanted to address your concern about like lunch. Please come forward, identify yourself, <laughs> and use the mic. Thank you. Oh, That's okay. Um, <laughs> My name is Amy Whittington. I work at the farmer's market also and will be doing community engagement with the grant money. Um, so to address your concern about what the vendors do with their produce, part of what our plan is is to engage people who deal with food insecurity in the area. So the Western Mass Food Bank, the Survival Center, um, they have a food pantry at St. John's and one at the Bangs Center. So I want to really work on kind of fostering relationships with the community because food insecurity is a huge issue. That's all. Yes. Oh, and I said First Baptist. Oh, First Baptist, sorry. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Sorry. Other comments? Mindy oh. Joe. Can I just ask a question about the Boltwood? Um, we haven't heard from the Inn on Boltwood, and I know you've been doing this for 48 years, that expansion and road closures a little bit younger than that. Do we know how they feel about losing their spots in front of them and then this reserve of two? Well, first of all, I haven't been doing this for 48 years. I should just clarify that. But um, <laughs> um, I, I should give just a little bit of my own history. I've been doing it since 1986, 86 to 2002. Then I, I did that thing of having children and had to break away from the market. And they asked me back in 2017. So I'm, in a sense, relearning and trying to rebuild and, and give the market a little bit of a new atmosphere and new face. And I, I think we've had a nice uptick in the last two or three years. Just the vendors are happier, I think the customers are happier, and that, that's my goal, is to kind of have this nice synergy. As far as, I'm cons as far as I know, the people at the Lord Jeff are also happy. We've had, uh, I, you know, I'm visiting with them every week. They're working in concert with us to have the parking lot clear, have their customers park out and back. They have been um, 
my, every interaction I've had, they've been inordinately supportive of what goes on at the market. And the customers, the clientele that are at the Lord Jeff, <coughs> when they come out on Saturday morning, not having realized that there was a farmer's market there, kind of fall into this thing that they describe as what a wonderful thing to wake up to. So I've not had any, any negative banter, interaction, uh, feedback, snippets of conversation that I've heard that's been anything but the plus, frankly. I think they appreciate the draw. Um, I think it benefits the in at Boltwood, the new naming of what it's going to be, that it's, it, it puts a nice clientele and a nice opportunity for their clientele right in front of them on Saturdays. And they give us tea and coffee every Saturday, and we're very happy That's about that. <laughs> so <laughs> I think it's a nice synergy, frankly. It's been okay. good. I've not, I've not heard a thing. Not heard a thing. Any other comments, questions? All right, then we have um, two motions before us that relate to this. I realized I should make a statement before the second motion. Okay. All right. So the first motion um, is to approve the closure of the section of Spring Street beginning at the intersection of South Pleasant heading east to the intersection with Boltwood Avenue. And that section of Boltwood Avenue beginning at the intersection of Spring Street running south to the access way to, the po to Potter Hall and further to approve the reservation of the two, two first two metered spaces on the east side of South Pleasant Street originating at Spring Street, moving south towards College Street to accommodate the Amherst Farmers Market each Saturday beginning April 20th, 2019 through November 16, 2019 from 7 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. And that is with David Machowski, market manager. Second. Okay, is there any further question? Dates? I'm sorry, the dates again. Wouldn't that be going to next? April 2nd, April 20th, 2019 through November 16, 2019. Oh, you're right, it would be. Okay. <laughs> All right. Any other questions or clarifications? Call the question. All those in favor, raise your hands. Opposed? Okay. Abstain. Okay. Uh, second motion. Yes. Um, I just want to state for ethics purposes that my husband is an employee of Amherst College, and since this motion kind of relates to that, I wanted to put that out there. I do not think that it is an actual conflict okay. for ethics reasons, so I will not be recusing myself. Okay. Uh, the second motion is to approve the reservation of the first two meter parking spaces on the east side of Boltwood Avenue, immediately south of the Porter Access Driveway, ex exclusively for guests of the Inn on Boltwood, each Saturday between April 20th, 2019 to November 16, 2019, from 7 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. Second. Further conversation? Questions? All those in favor? Opposed? Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, thank you. I look forward to coming to the market this summer again. April 20th, and uh, we're Spring. hoping there's a little less rainfall this year. Yes, that would be nice. <clears throat> would you like a break? Um, we're actually going to take a break while we switch, while I leave the room. <laughs> We are going to reconvene at this time and let the record show that I am officially turning the gavel over to Mandy Johannicke as Vice President. Thank you, Lynn. I, I have a permanently on mic. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> So the next item on the agenda is the, again, under the request for use of public ways, the Amherst Half Marathon and 5K Road Races. Um, I believe it might be Matt Anderson um, that is here from the Hartford Marathon Foundation to speak to this request. Good evening. Thank you. My name is actually Charlie Scanlon. I'm oh. the operations manager Sorry. for uh, <laughs> Hartford Marathon. Matt has two young children, so he's a little bit occupied. But thank you for having us again. 
So, uh, as you mentioned, we are uh, requesting use again of the public uh, ways for the Amherst Half Marathon uh, Team Relay and this year 5K. Uh, in the past, the event has taken place both Saturday and Sunday of the weekend that we've held it, uh, with the 5K taking place on Saturday and then the Half Marathon taking place on Sunday. However, due to a few different reasons, uh, we are deciding to combine everything into one day. Uh, so that would just be Sunday, November 10th, 2019. Uh, the half marathon and team relay will be held in the exact same format uh, with timing and all of the, uh, the same roadways being used. The 5K would then be added to Sunday and would start 10 minutes after the half marathon uh, at 8.10 that morning. Uh, and we have submitted a course to Chief Livingstone who softly approved uh, or at least gave kind of his blessing as far as he thinks things would work easily uh, and would not have a negative impact on traffic that morning. Um, so we would be happy to uh, you know, show you that map as well, but essentially it would start in the same place, travel down Massachusetts Ave, and then make a hard left onto East Pleasant, uh, East Pleasant Street uh, until it hit Eastman Lane, making a left on Eastman Lane, back onto uh, North Pleasant Street, and then finishing at Hagus Mall where the half marathon also finishes. Uh, otherwise, the event will be held in the exact same format, uh, working with uh, local municipalities as far as uh, safety is needed. Um, we are proud to say that we've had no major medical issues uh, with, uh, with people that have participated in the race the last two years, uh, and we uh, are glad to say that again. <laughs> so, um, otherwise, we work with the Survival Center, uh, as Councilwoman uh, suggested, and uh, we've made both monetary donations uh, as well as done sneaker drives and food drives, uh, knowing that they have kind of many needs uh, to serve people in the community. So, uh, again, we thank you for having us in the community as we're all the way from Connecticut, and we know that's an outside body, but uh, we're glad to be here, and we hope to be back in November. Thank you. Um, you addressed this, I believe, in the presentation. Any changes from last year's application? Yes. <laughs> you addressed all of them? Yes. Okay. Uh, counselor comments, questions? Anything? Well, it won't come as a surprise, I have a few. <laughs> if no one else does. One of them goes to the money again, so it's probably more of the town managers. There's police detail that's involved with this, so do does the Hartford Marathon pay at least those it costs for the police detail? Yeah, any kind of police details or ambulance details they compensate fully for. They arrange for and compensate directly for those things. And then the donation was something that we had requested early on um, as part of their, um, their, their proposal. Um, and they chose the Survival Center as their designated recipient for the funds. Um, my, my next question relates to road closures with the 5K, sure. that's nearly all three major north-south routes through UMass. Um, are they all closed at the same time or is it like serial closing as the runners go through? So, yep, so it's rolling closures. Uh, so, you know, never at one time will all three of those roads be shut to vehicle traffic. Uh, and oftentimes, you know, working with uh, police and other, uh, you know, uh, authorities, we often say that roads are not closed to vehicle traffic. Uh, we just have police officers out there monitoring, you know, uh, to make sure that runners can pass safely. So, you know, if you had lived on, you know, East Pleasant and you were trying to pull out of your driveway, very much welcome to do that and continue as you'd travel, uh, you, you know, but if someone was running in front of your driveway, we would just ask that you, you know, wait till they pass and then proceed safely down the road, um, you know, to make sure that you didn't hit anyone or put anyone in danger. But yeah, so all rolling closures uh, and, you know, again, leaving open uh, to, ve to vehicle traffic when safe uh, as much as possible. Pat. Um, I just want to say that um, last year's race, um, it was quite easy. I did have to wait a little bit every once in a while, but also uh, got directed on as a car. So I think that's well handled. Thank you. Excellent. Any other questions? I have one other one that relates to the Station Road Bridge. The marathon, half marathon and relay goes over the Station Road Bridge. Is the temporary bridge what? How's, it's more for the town manager, how's this going to work given all of it? <laughs> so they were aware of it last year when the temporary, when there was no temporary bridge, they were able to go across the uh, bridge because it allows pedestrian traffic. Um, and we anticipate that there will be a temporary bridge uh, in place by November. Um, so that should be not an issue for them. Uh, one other thing that's often comes up is 
um, through the, going through the center of town and because of church and things like that. And typically they start at 8, 8 a.m. and they're, I've been down there and they're through the center of town by 8.10, 8.15 at the, the last people are eight through, through by 8.15. So it's a very, it's a glut of people going through very quickly. It does, has not impacted uh, the churches at all. Any other? Yeah. Andy. Yeah, the only thing I would add is that um, in the first year, the only problem of court, in my observation and reported to me by former Captain Gunderson of the police department was a little bit of a problem around the Cushman Common. She suggested some modifications of how they direct traffic around the um, area for the second year and then I asked her and she said it had worked very well the second year with that change. So her report to me in the first two years, I can't ask her again because she won't be involved for the third year, but uh, that it seemed that she was satisfied. Any other comments, questions from the council? Is there any public comment on this matter? I am seeing none, which brings us to the motion time. Um, the motion is to approve the proposal by the Hartford Marathon Foundation to partially close roads on November 10th, 2019 from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. for the southbound lane on North Pleasant Street, East Pleasant Street, and North Pleasant Street. Further closure of South Pleasant Street from Massachusetts Avenue to Snell Street for approximately 40 minutes, 8 a.m. to 8.40, and to close East Pleasant Street from Triangle Street to Eastman Lane, Eastman Lane in its entirety, and North Pleasant Street from Eastman Lane to Massachusetts Avenue to accommodate the 5K road race, all subject to final approval by the Chief of Police. Um, is there a... Well, is there a motion? <laughs> I need someone to move. Excellent. Pat's moved. I just read it. <laughs> Pat has moved. And Evan has seconded. Um, is this all of it, or is this for just the 5K that I just read? Okay. It, it doesn't talk about Pine Street. Or East Pleasant, no, there's East Pleasant Street. Okay, just wanted to make sure it was the whole thing. Okay, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? All those against? It is unanimous with Lynn having recused herself, so 12-0. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. I think Lynn heard that. So we're going to welcome Lynn back to begin chairing, presiding over the meeting again. I highly recommend that you go back and see the Amherst Media people and the whole setup back there. It's very interesting. Thank you for the work back there. Um, Okay, our next one is the Amherst Garden Club. And do we have a representative here? I guess not. Okay. Um, for any of you that have stood in line, waited for the bell at 8 o'clock in the morning with your wagon or whatever, and your accompanying people have spotted which trees they want, this is the plant sale. You can tell I've obviously been to it. Um, so, um, Mr. Bachman, do you want to speak to this one particularly? Um, yes. Uh, so, this is for the setup of the of the plant sale. It's uh, once they're finished with the setup, then they they will release those parking spaces because those are important parking spaces as well. And it's another, again an event that has happened annually on the common. Um, but it's, it's helpful for the um, vendors and to unload, for them to unload. They don't think they'll use all of the parking spaces because they want to use just the number that they absolutely need, but they requested the entire south side of Spring Street lot in case they need them. Are there specific questions about this? Yes, Mandy Joe. 
Um, this is, it looked like it was for Friday morning only as plants get loaded in in preparation for the sale on Saturday. Is that right? I was trying to figure out the timing because they mentioned a tent set up on Thursday. They don't need anything for that. That's a tent on the common itself. And again, we have not been charging for these, the use of these spots. Correct. Is there any further questions? Yes, Mandy Joe. Sorry, can I ask about the charge to, to the town manager? It sounded like sometimes we charge, if someone needs like a spot for a moving van, do we charge them for that? Or is there essentially no charge at all for any reservation of parking spots in this town? There are, uh, we do charge for reserving metered spaces for um, certain events. Some events traditionally have not had to pay because they are either by nonprofit organizations or fundraisers or something that has been going on in the common for a long time. If a new person comes in and uh, needs four parking spaces for whatever it is, we charge them on a per diem basis for the parking space. Further questions? All right, then the motion in this case is uh, to re approve the reservation of 18 metered spaces, metered parking spaces on the south side of the Spring Street parking lot for the Garden Club of Amherst annual plant sale setup on Friday, March 17th, 2019 from 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. Susan Sheldon is chair. Is there a second? Second. Okay, in this case it's Dorothy. Okay. Um, Just to clarify, it's May 17th, 2019. Whatever I said was wrong. <laughs> Just, <laughs> I'm moving for a really early closing tonight. <laughs> um, is there any, uh, uh, any other questions about the motion? Move the, move the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay. Can I, can I make a comment? Yes. Okay. I just want to say that the plant sale is a wonderful tradition at Amherst, and it is uh, some, a place where you can, it's really buy wonderful things at a very modest cost yeah. that have been uh, grown and nurtured by local gardeners. And I think it makes the town a rich place to have these events taking place on the green. Great. Okay, moving on. Uh, we are now to the public way memorandum from the town manager. And Mr. Bachelman. Thank you. So in your packet is a beginning, uh, it, it's, a, it's a memo to begin a conversation I think the council would, would probably like to have. Uh, under the charter, as you know, the council is responsible for the public ways. And public ways mean, means all of the all the roads and streets in the town, but also for the town common. The town common is part of the, the public way. Not all parks are, so Kendrick Park is not part of the public way, but the, the, nor the north common, the south common in front of uh, the inn on Boltwood, uh, the south common in South Amherst, um, the East Street common, those are all public ways and under the jurisdiction of the council. So. In the past, we've had a number of um, requests that have come in to utilize the public ways. Uh, some of them are last minute, many of them are, are annual, like you've seen already, uh, and some of them are in between. So what my request to the council is, uh, is a question is, how would you like us to handle them? Would you like them to all come to your meeting? Would you like them to be processed through one of your committees first in advance? Um, would you like to delegate some of that authority to either the town manager's office or to another board? Um, and so I've tried to put together a material for your um, consideration. I'm not looking for any kind of response tonight, um, but, but it would be helpful for our office as these things come in to know how the council would like to address them. And I'll, in addition to what you've seen tonight, we often will get a, a company who wants to come in and they need to put a dumpster in front of their building as they're doing construction. 
So we say, well, okay, if, that's, if it complies with the fire chief and police chief and they sign off on it, um, well, we might say, yes, this is a good spot to put it for two days and we charge them whatever we would have uh, gathered from the meter for those two days. Um, so it's, it's typically, it typically that type of thing that's, sort of, that's a low scale thing, not, not a huge impact. Um, but then there are larger issues that come to, uh, that are under your jurisdiction. So if someone asks for a change of parking on a public way, they, they either want to institute parking or they want to take away parking. That's usually a bigger issue that involves a neighborhood that you would probably want to retain and have a public hearing on and engage in that conversation. So what I'm requesting is I figure out how we can have that conversation and have the council try to um, figure out how it would like each of these types of things to be addressed and look at them in categories and then give us some direction on how you'd like to address them. So I'd like to divide this into, first of all, are there some questions clarifying at this point about the memorandum? Yes, Alyssa. Yes, I have several comments on the memorandum based on my history of working on the public way. And one is that I appreciate the town manager's description of things like Kendrick Park, Sweetser Park, parks are under the town manager's jurisdiction. The common is actually considered part of the roadway, strangely enough, so it's the public way. And it's under, used to be under the select board's jurisdiction, is now under the town council's jurisdiction. But that's a funny thing because many years before I or Mr. Steinberg or any other recent select board members served, that got delegated to the town manager's office. So we have traditionally, since 2007 at least, um, since before 2007, we talked about as, a, as the keepers of the public way, which the council now is, the parking for the farmers for things around the common but not for the actual use of the common. So for the Taste of Amherst, for example, you know there's always parking blocked off. So we would have that motion as keepers of the public way, but we as keepers of the public way, despite the fact that the common is the public way, we're not making the decisions on whether or not the taste was going to be on the common. So have, looking at all this again is a perfectly reasonable idea, it seems like. It also made sense to go ahead and delegate that because that was a DPW function, town manager function, police department, fire department, sanitary. I mean, it's, it's all different kinds of town departments. But technically, it got delegated a long time ago, and I would argue that we should make a proactive decision mm -hmm. as a town council, as keepers of the public way, that we are continuing to delegate that part of it. This is a whole nother level of delegation that's being asked for that we have not previously delegated. And again, much of that may make a ton of sense, but so there's several levels to this. One is, are we going to leave delegated something that was delegated long before any of us were doing this? And two, are we going to delegate some additional things? Associated with those delegations, one of the things that I'm concerned about is that, and I, I think it was just a matter of trying to lay out all the possible options here, is it talks about requests for short term, requests for short term, and then permanent. There's like nothing here about what's long term versus permanent. And so that would need to be teased out. Also, I cannot fathom a situation that was 14 days. So I have no idea why 14 days is in here. As, as it, it means nothing to someone who was a keeper of the public way. Let me put it that way to you. And so there are sometimes four days of parking associated with the taste or one day of parking associated with the farmer's market every single week. There's never been two weeks of parking associated with an event. So that's just, that's not an arbiter that we've used. So it may be that the town manager in research with other places now knows of a 14 day thing, but I'm unaware of the select board ever doing a 14 day thing. And so don't be too wedded to some of the words, I guess is what I'm saying, as you're trying to sort this out if this ends up getting sent over. And finally, I guess I have obviously a bunch of questions about this, but I would hope that if this does get put over to governance, although I think an argument could be made that it's a rules issue 
um, at this temporary moment, but maybe we just leave a section in the rules that says where this goes, because honestly, we've not done policy yet, really, as this body exists, mm -hmm. that whatever group is looking at this more before it comes back to the council includes talking to somebody who was an elected official who was dealing with the public way, and I don't think governance has anybody like that on it right now. And so just to, to do that reach out. I also don't have any reason to believe that Downtown Parking Working Group will continue to function in the way that it has in the past, and so depending on them to be at least the ones associated with downtown, and they've never made recommendations associated with downtown use of the public way in the short term. And so I, these are just pieces of context that I offer you that you may not be aware of associated with what's written here. But I do think it's great to you know, kind of take a look at the whole thing and figure out what to, what to piece out so that everybody understands who does what. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Dorothy. Um, I have a brief question about, um, does this include food trucks? Um, we have food truck regulations that were looked at, but it, it could, yeah, it's a public way, so of course it would okay. be under you. Okay. Alyssa? So luckily we don't have any but one food truck right now that actually functions. The, the complication with this, this was a huge issue for us when we were trying to make this work as keepers of the public way, because there are both questions about not blocking the sidewalk or, quite, or the kind of food cart that's actually lunch truck, technically, that's on the street versus the kind that's on the sidewalk and how many can you fit and what spots. And there are very specific spots in town where they are allowed, but, but the licensing of those used to belong to the select board as well as the public way. Now the licensing of those belongs to the licensing board. Right. So now there's two separate bodies that would be associated with that. So that's another little added quirk to all of this as to how that would work. Luckily, you're not struggling right now with 25 of them trying to come in, but um, it is, in fact, it's the license commissioners that decide whether or not they can be someplace, and they would obviously, they use, that was all the same group of people deciding where they could be. Now you have a separation of powers between two different groups to try and figure that out. So it would be all well and good for them to give them a license, but then if this group said, but there's no place you can put the car. <laughs> that wouldn't be very helpful. Other comments, questions? I mean, yes, Mandy Jo. I'm focused on money tonight. So um, who, it, is it us as keepers of the public way that could set potential rates and policies for what would be charged? Or does that happen somewhere else? And is there like a common say rate sheet right now for who gets charged and who doesn't get charged and what they get charged or what they don't and all of that. So we charge, uh, except for these sort of traditional things that have come before um, the town previously. And I think the fee is $10 a day, which is, uh, it depends whatever the meter generates, but it's, it's low. It's, I think the going rate is $10 a day for reserving a parking space. Who sets that? Is that supposed to be us, it I be, guess, is the be, question? Yeah, if, if it's a public way, it's up to you. Okay. Additional questions on this? So um, the recommendation on the motion is that this be referred, <coughs> excuse me, to um, the Government Organization and Legislation Committee. Before we place that in motion, is there discussion? Yes, Kathy. Um, I guess I wonder which committee it should be referred to, because I think what we're, we're talking to is, um, as I understood what Alyssa was saying, is some of this is embedding policies we had before, and some of it is new policies around treatment of public way. and. One idea we had in the charge you're going to see next week on the Committee on Economic Development to, would be to refer public way policies to that committee because it's talking about the way how town resources and community is being, and, it's, and it would be, I think I'm making the distinction on a, 
a policy change that has some implications to it as opposed to just refinement of code. So I'm questioning whether GOL is the right committee. We don't have this other committee yet, but we had tentatively drafted a charge that would include the public way in that committee. Yes, Evan. Um, so I understand what you're saying. I think that um, what we're considering right now is my understanding is who should this go to to decide who requests would go to. So regardless of whether it goes to GOL or something else, GOL could come back and say uh, all future reservations of public way should go to community and economic development, but we're not quite at that stage yet. But I do want to sort of return to what Alyssa said, which is, is this a uh, GOL conversation or is this a rules conversation? And I'm not sure what the answers to that. Um, so I'd be interested to hear maybe some of my fellow GOL members or some of the rules committee members speak to that. Um, I, I am getting to a point where I'm getting a little uh, concerned uh, for my my colleagues on the rules committee that we are dumping almost every conversation on you. I feel like we've had, I mean, we just had a conversation in OCA the other day that ended with, eh, so I, this has to go to the to rules, or was that geo? I don't even know, they're all running together. Um, but but I, I, I do, I don't want to, uh, rules committee has a big task ahead of them and I don't want to put more than they need. Dorothy. <clears throat> Well, I had been planning to speak up and say that the new committee that we've been working on uh, does, in fact, include public ways in it. But after Alyssa spoke, I thought, you know, I would like to have a long conversation with our ad hoc committee and Alyssa because it sounds like there are so many aspects to the things that have been brought up that are in your memo uh, that involve town departments and that just go all over the place. I think it's going to be... Um, I think we want to roll in it, but I don't think, I mean, from my point of view, not the whole ball of wax. I mean, it's very complex. So I think it takes a lot of conversation, which is probably why you sent us the memo. It is the reason, and it is also the reason that um, in setting the agenda tonight, we decided since we had three uh, requests that were ready to be acted on, that we give you a sample of what it was like. And um, with that in mind, say, okay, let's put this in some committee that will then come back with a recommendation as to how the more significant ones would be handled and the ones that are not as significant, much more routine, might be handled and don't even have to come to the council. So it's a, an issue of um, really wanting a committee, and in this case, I, I differentiate rules of procedure uh, from uh, governments, governance organization and legislation, because rules of procedure it goes out of business in, six, in less than six months now, and is really looking at the rules and procedure of the council. Um, this is really an issue of, as a legislative body, what do we want to do? And so that's why I uh, felt that this was the right place to refer it. I also think rules of procedure has a ton of stuff to get done. <laughs> Mandy Jo, you're on both. I, I was actually going to say nearly what you just said, Lynn. The, the rules of procedure committee is, is tasked with um, proposing, quote, proposing to the council for adoption rules regulating the procedures of the town council. That's right. from its charge. Right. Um, it has exactly six months from December 3rd to get that task done, right. which is... June 3rd, right. um, that's three months away. Um, and so it has a lot on its task to do that. I don't, while I see a argument, an argument for a f figuring out whether to delegate um, public way items or not delegate as a potential rule regulating the procedures of town council, it's not what I've necessarily thought of the rules committee doing. I've thought of the rules committee of really dealing with what are our subcommittees going to be, what are our rules during debate going to be, and things like that. And I don't see this public way discussion falling into that. Um, 
I don't know whether governance is the right committee. It seems like it is, given if you're not going to put it at rules, and I don't think rules, I think rules is a worse committee than government governance um, to put it at, I guess, for that reason. The other committees we have, I don't really fit it either. So I think a default to this governance, which has a legislation component, and given that we are the keepers of the public way under the charter, we might determine that this needs to be a bylaw if we ask for delegation and not just a motion, it might need to be part of a bylaw at some point. And if that's the case, then it falls more into the legislation portion of governance. And I know governance was not charged with doing substantive issues, um, but there really isn't a committee at this point charged with creating substantive issues that this council wants to look at. Um, so I, I know it's an imperfect fit, but it to me seems more logical than rules at this time. Right. It, it, at some point, um, I'm recognizing that there is still this other committee out there, and we actually are going to be talking about that on our agenda next one week from tonight. Um, but the issue here is really how to divide it up, if you will how to legislate it differently. It doesn't mean that eventually the committee that is yet to be named um, is, does, won't have a role. It just means that's, it, this would define what that committee's role might be. Alyssa. So the way I see this flowing is that and I think maybe Dorothy touched on this, is that eventually, once it's determined by whatever fashion, which things we actually retain control over, mm -hmm. then those things sound like they will in fact fit very well mm -hmm. under this new committee. So right. once you know whether or not you're doing, you're doing things like the Garden Club, then you'll know that that's yours and that will be your thing. Mm -hmm. In order to figure out which the those things are, I think it's really important to remember that rules, of course, is not going away because then the rules are just done and we never have to think about them again. Rules exist because it's required by the Charter. Governance, organization, and legislation is just a made up thing that we decided to do. Um, rules will be all the work that rules is doing and that does or does not get done by the beginning of June is now, because we have governance, is going to get thrown over to governance. Mm -hmm. So. It, there's, there's a continuum there. So we're serving as that, rules is serving as that group right now, but governance, a year, we had this conversation previously, a year from now, a lot of things would get re sent to governance because rules wouldn't exist. So there would be no place to send it other than to governance. I was feeling quite pretty confident about sending it over to governance until it, I was reminded that they've not been charged with substantive issues and this is a substantive issue. So that's where it gets complicated. So again, you know, were this to come up a year from now, it might, we might be in a different place. So I, I'm not sure there is a perfect solution and a, a less bad and a less good solution, but it may make sense given that this is rather of a piece all of its own, and it's a it's a fairly complex issue, but it's also not so intertwined with some other things yet. Maybe it would make sense to go ahead and send it to governance because they don't have quite the workload that rules does at this moment in time, right. and maybe that would be an, a more efficient way of them having more time to deal with this while rules is doing the rules things. Okay, is there any further comment on this? All right, I'm going to try a motion, and the motion is to refer the public ways memorandum for the town from the town manager to the government organization and legislation committee. Do I have a second? George, uh, George Ryan. Any further conversation? All those in favor? That's no. Okay. Uh, Opposed? Okay. Motion passes 12 to 1. Um, moving on. The appointment of non-resident 
non-voting residents to the Finance Committee. And let me just preface this by saying the following. Um, as you recall, we adopted the charge for the Finance Committee, which included four non-voting residents. We are clearly into the financial season and the active participation of residents on the committee would be welcome. The Finance Committee is a standing committee of the council and council members of standing committees are appointed by the council president. However, as stated in the charter, section 5.5b, council rules shall ad address the appointment of such members. And that is particularly out of the section related to the Finance Committee. So therefore, the recommendation here is to refer this to the Rules of Procedure Committee to determine how non-voting residents would be appointed to the Finance Committee. Question. I'm sorry, Kathy. I, I, it's more of a comment. Um, are there people waiting in the wings for these appointments? We have had applicants for the Finance Committee. I have seen none of those applications, but I understand we have a significant number. Okay, so I think, uh, Alyssa, is our next meeting May, May 5th? Am I getting the right? You know, I'm just thinking that if you want to move it quickly, um, I think that's, am I, do I have the right date for the next one? Yeah, so I'm just thinking that it should be at the top of our agenda so we can report it back. Well, I, I leave that to the chair of the committee. Um, are there other comments? I'm sorry, Mindy Jo. This is one of the things us charter commissioners didn't really notice is a odd little quirk of the charter. Um, but I'm concerned with holding off on these appointments until not only can the rules committee come up with a procedure, but bring that then procedure back to this council to then go through that procedure to make a vote when the town manager's budget is due May 1. And that is two months away. And in theory, we might not then have resident appointments close to then, and we've got a lot of other stuff going on. So I, I'm, I'm concerned about that. That's not to say I don't think rules should look at this and come up with a procedure. I'm not sure it's wise to wait for that to happen before allowing the president to make the appointments for, say, the next six months until the end of this fiscal year. I guess it's about three months. So that we've got some appointments that maybe end June 30 under the charter two, six or whatever, two, three, whatever it is that says the town, the t council president appoints all members of council committees. She has at this point in theory, the right to do that for the finance committee. Maybe we could go ahead and have that done until the end of this fiscal year so that rules committee has the time to come up with a procedure, but that our finance committee is not operating without those members for most of this budget cycle. Yeah, um, I'm sorry, Evan. Yes. <coughs> Excuse me. So just to <coughs> add on to what Mandy Jo said, because um, the process she laid out sounded lengthy, but I actually think it would be lengthier. Um, because in let's, so I do think we need council rules to decide. And so I do think that rules committee does need to come up with a process. However, appointments go through the appointments committee. And so unless rules committee came back and said, we're just gonna give this to the town council president, our rules are town council presidents do this. If rules committee came back and said, perhaps anything other than town council president does this, my assumption is rules will deliberate, come up with a recommendation, bring it to the council, which will likely then say, okay, now it's the purview of OCA, and then it will go to a process that OCA is currently working on now. Um, my guess would be that process would mean that no residents would be appointed to the finance committee this budget cycle, and we would have uh, residents appointed 
after June for the next budget cycle. And so I think um, I, I'm not, I am stating an opinion, so I can't say that. But I'm not saying necessarily an opinion on, on, on what to vote on the, on the potential motion, um, but recognizing that uh, waiting on this means that we will likely have a budget the budget process going on right now will not include residents because I, I just don't imagine it going through rules to the council to OCA in time for us to actually appoint resident members if the budget has to be passed by the end of June. Andy. So I guess I'm going to speak at it from the side of the finance committee, both from my um, more from my experience on the prior finance committee that existed here in this community, uh, but a little bit for this finance committee. Um, I think I've said before to some people, maybe to the entire group, that it took um, me, even with a fair amount of experience in accounting issues and budgeting issues with nonprofits, because of the type of um, special legal requirements that um, are um, involved with municipal financing, which is a whole different set of rules, a year to really understand and fully participate in the committee. And it was a um, process that um, was helped because there were people on the committee who had been doing it for a while, and we all helped each other out as new members came on. Um, the, uh, where we are right now, I think, is as a committee, is we have a uh, really good committee. I'm really pleased to be working with the group that, that is our current finance committee. But we're a little bit in the learning mode, and that's what our next meeting is going to be about. So um, one thing for you to consider during this discussion is that you would be bringing people on right at the beginning of the budget process and as we're going through this learning process and have, you know, partly got there, and um, unless there are people being appointed who are on the prior finance committee, um, they're going to be behind and um, it, it, it may make it more difficult for them, more discouraging for them, and more difficult for the other members of this finance committee as they're trying to get up to speed to get done what needs to happen in order to help present the material and review the material for the um, budget season that's going forward. And um, the second piece uh, with the same pre preface, so I don't have to go through it all again, is that bringing somebody in for just one this year and they're not being continuing members uh, isn't really an effective use of their time or anyone else's time. I really would encourage that we bring people on who are really going to be committed to working with for a period of time so that they can become fully educated and participating members of the committee and uh, be there um, through multiple cycles so that it um, can actually gain some utility for doing what I think is intended. Sarah. So as chair of OCA, I would like to say I, I do think that these resident appointments are definitely town council appointments. Um, so that's something like absolutely if we want to start now and, and hand it to you know rules and say take a look at that We could do that Andy beat me to the punch on what he just <laughs> said because I know when I first was on finance committee Andy told me it's okay. We got your back. It'll take a little while. It's a steep learning curve and And it definitely is and in my feeling both as chair of OCA and also as someone who served on finance committee is that I think that um, I think it would be detrimental to, like Andy said, you know, just give this, you know, to someone. Like if you, I, I believe in you totally and completely, but then you are bringing people on for a certain amount of time. They, they don't have time to catch up, and that can be really, that can feel really 
awful when you don't completely understand. And then to know that most, you know, there's a chance that after you've struggled through this, mm -hmm. a whole yeah. bunch, you're going to be gone. So yeah. I would rather, I myself think that there's some merit in perhaps not putting them on until June. July 1. Until July 1. Right. Alyssa. It will not surprise anyone who worked on the Charter Commission that there, I, there are some quirks in the Charter that I think weren't quite what people intended. And strangely enough, this particular item, as our president stated, says the council will develop rules for this. Um, it doesn't say that for planning board or ZBA appointments. And I don't know why it says that, but it does. And given that it does, it seems that the conversation at rules might potentially, and yes, it is going to be added to the agenda, um, the rules conversation might in fact be very brief except for the idea that has arisen, which was the idea of the president potentially appointing. That conversation never arose with the ZBA or planning board as being something the president would do because it's not a town council committee. But these are also not town councilors that are on a town council committee. So the conversation may be brief or long, but it does need to take place at rules because it says in the charter it's going to be a rule and that's where we do rules right now. Um, but it shouldn't necessarily drag out for a long period of time. It can probably be handled at one meeting, which is in fact next week. And of course, things continue to come up every single time we meet so that we're not doing the other work we were doing, but this is one of the things that needs to be done. Um, I wish we had all known sooner that it needed to be done this way, but that's the fault of not having a transition document that would laid out for us in a chart form when we needed to do various things. So we're behind. Well, it's not a surprise. We are where we are. And given the, the feedback that we've heard and what we've seen happen with finance committees in the past, I don't think we're hurting the budget process to not have these folks in place and certainly not to stuff them in in a short period of time. What I'm really looking forward to when we do appoint them eventually is that they're going to be super at helping with outreach and doing things like getting people to the annual budget forum, getting people engaged in different district meetings, talking about the budget, et cetera. But none of that can happen in time for the budget forum next week. So um, given where we are at this point, we have advertised, the town manager had previously advertised for finance committee members that were town council appointments. We put out another call for that last week, and we fully expect that OCA, which I happen to also be serving on, um, will be doing a process to appoint that unless rules has a different opinion on how to do that. Because again, rules didn't have that option of having an opinion on things like ZBA or planning board. So the process that we would bring back would just be limited to, at this point, unless we come up with yet another option, would be, oh, rules thinks the president should just do it, or rules thinks it should be like all the other council appointments, like ZBA, planning board, participatory budgeting, and ranked choice voting. That would be the extent of the process that was presented to town council, like those two sentences, unless some other new thing comes up. So this is not like a big presentation you need to deal with. Other comments? Shalini. This seems to be an assumption that the residents who are, are all new and don't have experience, I think it would be highly beneficial if we do have residents who have been involved in the finance committee, because right now we only have Andy who, I, I believe, who has experience. So if he did have residents who had experience with the finance committee work before, I think it would be beneficial to all of us. Pat. You can hear me. Uh, on, building on what Shalane is saying is it feels to me like we could uh, or you could appoint um, member, former members of the finance committee who are residents to work through uh, until the end of the budget period and then knowing that we then may be appointing other people. But I think we're losing experience. Um, that may be really important. 
Kathy? I was just going to um, try to build on, I think, the point Andy was making. I think short-term appointments are not helpful if you're bringing it into a functioning committee. And we might. Short -term. Short, well, short-term experience, but you're still bringing them in. If this isn't quite the same way finance has worked before. So we might want to consider whether some of these appointments might be two-year appointments rather than one-year appointments. I mean, I, I think we could decide for the residents that some commitment that they come on, they learn, and they stay. So I'm not saying that necessarily, but it's something that is, even though we're doing just one year for the council members, we might want to make the residents more continuous. It's a, it's a reason for having it be considered in rules and coming back with how what might you want to do it, because we could set a different term on this group of people. Um, so <laughs> this is a tricky one, because I, I don't like, I, I do not like to have a committee appointment predisposed by whether or not somebody was on a previous committee. So I, that piece of what you're saying or various people have said concerns me. So that in other words, the only, re, the only people eligible would be people who'd served on previous finance committees. Uh, that's not the way we advertised and uh, it doesn't seem like the way in which we should screen. Um, Given all of this, I feel like we need to refer this to the Rules of Procedure Committee, and it may very well mean that we do not have new resident non-voting members to finance until July 1. Um, it's, uh, it's an unfortunate gap that um, the council just in a, in our transition, I mean it. You know, you just get to these things as fast as you can. Um, but I don't know that we have. It's because it, when rules comes back to us, you also need to be able to say, this will be the term of people, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, are there other questions, comments? Yeah. I just want to point out that I believe the term was set in the charge for the finance committee. So I believe the term says one uh, year in that yeah. charge. Okay. So people would be appointed for a year in the finance committee. Okay. Um, I mean, yeah, right. Right. Yeah. I, uh, what was the previous terms of finance committee members, Andy? Prior, uh, it was three-year terms. Yeah, that gave you, gave you the learning curve that allowed you to understand the budget and be able to contribute to it. Dorsey. Uh, looks like I was trying to figure out the dates of when these different things could happen. And uh, if it went to the Rules Committee on March 5th, and if we could, as Alyssa said, decide it on that day, then it would be back here on March 18th. Um, and then we would send it to outreach communications. They would hear it on the 25th of March. Um, and then it could possibly be back here the first meeting in April, the town council. Uh, back here with what? With a, well, with recommended appointments. That means you'd have to do the interviews and everything by that time. I don't see that happening. Sarah. I, I just want to say that we're still working very quickly and, and hard on our process. But we won't have a process that quickly, and I am loath to do something that's... Um, that, that we haven't really made solid just to do it quickly. Alyssa. If I could just add, we when she says work quickly and hard, the 
obviously five of us will agree with that, but it's also because we have been meeting every week. We've had six meetings. Right. We have 15 meetings coming up that we have scheduled already. Right. Um, it isn't that we didn't think of a great process, we just aren't allowed to do it legally. And that means that we're different than every other municipality in the Commonwealth who just does whatever they want and nobody notices. But since we asked the question, we've been told no. And so we are trying to figure out a process that meets all kinds of reasons, which we can talk about at great length at another time. But it isn't that we don't have plans. We have lots of plans. Unfortunately, they have been thwarted thus far. And so we are working on this very quickly, but whether or not we could in fact be ready for April, is, it's possible, and it's also not something I think we're ready to commit to. Other comments from, I'm going to um, use the privilege of the president and recognize a comment from the audience. <laughs> uh, I'm not supposed to. I'm Barbara Pearson from 11 Page Street. I just think that these are non voting members, right? And one of their goals is to get interest into the process and to help it propagate throughout the community. And if I understand that we have several people who have applied, why does it hurt to have, I mean, it looks like this is an opportunity for input from community. It doesn't mean you have to take it. <laughs> it doesn't mean you have, you know, if, and since it's a short term, the, the process is, is over at July or whatever. But I would urge the, the council to try and come up with a way to have these people be on some kind of special advisory committee that's pre-legislative um, or whatever, whatever, you know, predates the rules. Mm -hmm. Just seems like you've asked them if they want to be on the finance committee, they've said yes, and they say, oh, sorry. Okay, thank so you. So if there were some way of just incorporating their feedback, their input, without being obliged, they're not, they haven't been through the training. Anyway, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Um, let me just uh, not respond per se, but say a couple things regarding budget and the budget season. Um, we do have our forum on the 7th, and that's clearly a time for, in fact, ex pretty much exclusively public comment. In addition to that, the Finance Committee, Andy, I think, is beginning to think that not only will we be meeting at least once a week, we might start meeting twice a week at some point, uh, and we expect there to be a lot of public comment at that point, because we're gonna be hearing. In fact, we are looking at the calendar and we have asked people, counselors, to indicate to Angela Mills whether or not you want to start coming to some of the finance committee meetings, because we may call them as committees of the whole, so that um, you have the opportunity to hear more about the budget in the detail that the Finance Committee is going to be hearing about it. Um, I don't know that we have a perfect solution here. Um, and I think timing is not, and the Charter in this case, uh, has left us with this kind of hanging situation. So, uh, further comments? Otherwise, I'm gonna call the question. Okay, um, this is ad addressed to Andy. Uh, we know that these residential members would not have a vote. Um, you also know that the Finance Committee has a huge job to do in a short period of time. You addressed how the members would feel, the new members would feel, how frustrating it would be for them. I'm asking you as chair, do you think that um, bringing people on at this point and for a short period would um, hold up the business of the Finance Committee or were you just thinking that they would find it very hard? It's really hard for me to answer that question. Um, 
It depends upon the individuals chosen because some people who are quick learners or willing to um, put in a lot of work and show some patience and um, not be sort of diverting the process to their needs, then it would work really, it would work fine. Um, but it really depends upon who's appointed and how the, uh, we don't really have a, an appointment review process in place yet so that we can't get the right kind of questions that we would, we would ask into that process, but we could. Uh, it just, you know, so I really don't have a good answer other than that. Shalini. So is it possible to create special circumstances where we choose based on experience just for this transition period? No? Okay. It's that short-term appointment. I mean, is that really fair? I'm going to call the question because I think that we need to send this to rules and um, have them wrestle with this in a more detailed way. Um, so the motion um, is to, ref to refer appointment of non-voting residents to, finance to the Finance Committee to the Rules of Procedure Ad Hoc Committee. Is there a second? Second. Mandy Jo? Further conversation? All those in favor? Okay, that one's unanimous. Okay. Um, the next one is council liaisons to committees. Part of this is kind of continuing to try to move things along. Um, a lot of, several counselors have been asking about liaisons to committees. And uh, it, the charter does speak to this, but it's really left to the council. Uh, the previous select board um, did have liaisons to committees. In fact, they even described um, that in a manual that I was just recently made aware of. Um, and the manual states something like the following. Select board members serve as liaisons to a variety of boards and committees and attend as many meetings of those other bodies as is practical for them to do so. Liaisons are not members of those committees and should not be doing the committee's work or unduly influencing that work. While the liaison role is relatively open-ended, the key point is for the, in this case, select board <coughs> member to provide um, relevant information the committee might not otherwise have, such as details in this case about town meeting deadlines, reminders about open meeting law, budget process, et cetera. And, <coughs> and, similar, and similarly bring back key information regarding aspects of the committee's work of which the select board should be aware. So again, this is something that council members have asked and I would like to have the council discuss this and then suggest a referral to the Rules of Procedure Ad Hoc Committee. <coughs> the floor is open for discussion. Alyssa. So I'm gonna, this is also being added to the list of topics for rules for next time and it's, if it had not been something that various counselors had brought to the president's attention, it would have ended up in the rules eventually, but would not be getting attention next week. Um, but because people have been asking about it, I said, certainly we will add that to our list of topics. It is an entirely appropriate thing for rules to be covering, just as the select board ha appointed committee handbook currently governs the behavior of many multi-member bodies, multiple member bodies in town. Um, the liaison work that is addressed in there on page 14, which I thought we were going to have a copy of in our packet, but we'll get you one for our report. And that was worked on 
very carefully and rules needs to look at it again as to the role of the liaison because we have had members in the past of bodies who wanted to be liaisons who believed they were the sixth or seventh member of a committee. And that is absolutely, as our president read out, not what the intention was. And so if that's the intention of this council, then that would need to be codified in a different way than it has been done in the past. Are there other comments? I'm sorry, Mandy Jo. Um, I think I would just say we should really think closely as to maybe which committees we potentially want liaisons to when we're looking at our standing committees and our workload as counselors. Um, this goes back to what Alyssa was saying in terms of, you know, what is the role of a liaison? I think we should also consider do we need or want them for all or only a small portion of the 70 some committees this town has? Is it something like that? 60 or 70? You know, because that would be a lot of non voting liaison roles for each council member, or should we consider maybe a select few of those committees to have liaisons for? This is one of the reasons it needs to go to the rules of procedure. <laughs> yes, Pat. I have a, uh, just a general question to the council. What is the, um, what would be negative about a liaison being able to vote on a committee? I mean, a school committee, it's clear. It's very different. It's, it's uh, an elected body. So of course you would only be a liaison doing the uh, two um, activities. But I'm, I'm curious uh, to hear what people have to say about that. The charter in section 29D says non-voting liaisons, the town council may select from its membership non-voting liaisons to multiple member bodies, the school committee, and or the library trustees. So the charter restricts us to non-voting liaisons. I, I certainly don't speak for the charter commission, but I do have to say having chaired a committee in which there was a liaison. He sits to my left. Um, it was very beneficial, but at no time did I ever feel that um, Andy was there other than to provide us with information we might otherwise not have had about timelines. And at no time did he ever say, and this is how the select board has voted, or this is what we would like. In other words, he didn't speak in terms of representing the body, which is the big danger of having counselors as voting members of committees, is they're seen as then speaking on behalf of the body. And I guess, brief comment. I liked the sentence that said, would not do the work of the committee. <laughs> and if you don't do the work of the committee, you shouldn't vote. I think we are gonna have plenty of work. Any further discussion on this? Okay, then I'm gonna move the um, following to refer council liaisons to committees to the Rules and Procedure Ad Hoc Committee. Is there a second? Councilor Schwartz. Any further comment? All those in favor? That's unanimous. Um, so, the other day, we're sitting in the office, we're setting the agenda, and the issue of the annual town audit comes up, and I go, oh yeah, oh, yeah. that's right. We do get one of those, don't we? And of course, we pulled out the charter, and of course, at some point, we need to address the audit. So this evening, uh, before you is a um, proposal um, to create an audit committee. Um, in this case, trying to keep things a little simpler, uh, to have that audit committee be um, a member of three, three people from the town council and um, it would just, the, the goal is really two. 
It's one is to review the audit with the auditors. The second one is perhaps not this year. In fact, personally, I would recommend not this year. Um, review whether or not we want to continue with the same auditors over time. Um, that's a much larger discussion that should be kept to this committee. But the charge before you is to create an audit committee of three people. And while it's not immediately pressing, um, however, the audit is almost completed for the town. In fact, it may be completed by now, or will by the beginning of March, as I recall. And it is very important as an elected body um, for us to assume our responsibilities of reviewing that audit and its recommendations. So the reason you have the charge before you is to create such a committee and then we would go forward with such appointments. Yes, Dorothy. Um, I would nominate Kathy for that committee. <laughs> We're not even, we haven't even created the committee. Okay. If such a committee existed. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yes, Andy. Yeah, just um, for your information, in the prior audit committee that had existed, um, the committee consisted of members of the select board, member of the finance committee, um, a representative appointed by the school committee, um, representative from the library trustees, since um, library and mm -hmm. schools uh, were also a part of the audit, and then one citizen member who was appointed to serve in addition. So there was more than just, um, you know, as to necessarily a select board committee, it was actually, if you take to the majority, it was not even the majority between the select board and the finance committee. Um, and so I just wanted to point that out for your information and point out that there were two documents that we received along with the proposed draft charge. And one of them recommended that the committee be of the governing body and the other made the recommendation that it be a broader committee. And uh, so the guidance that we were receiving from those two, the, um, uh, Government Finance Officers Association and the uh, Department of Revenue's Division of Local Services mm -hmm. are contrary to each other on the point. Wow. Thank you. Comment, question. Do you have, yes, uh, Mandy Jo. Sorry, um, as this is suggested to be referred to the GOL committee, um, as chair of the GOL committee, could we have some guidance as to, um, we've been struggling with how much we can change a charge um, based on the GOL's charge to review only for technicalities. So as chair, I'm reaching out to this council to discuss not, not that I'm seeing many changes to this, and I'm gonna say that right now, but um, what I, I'd like to hear from the council, sort of their vision of what the referral would be for, for this charge, um, whether it is truly for a formatting issue or whether it's for things like membership that could be considered more of a substantive issue and all. I personally think it's it is around membership, and I think it be could be argued either way. In other words, a membership more like the previous audit committee, where it represented because the audit is comprehensive; it includes the library, it includes the schools, and includes the town. So it's not as if. Um, and even though we pass a budget for all of that, nevertheless, we do heavily rely on the schools and the library for the knowledge of their budget. Yes. Um, can I make a motion? Please. Okay. I move that we have an audit committee 
which will include a member of the town council, a member of the finance committee, a representative from the school committee, a representative from the library trustees, and a citizen representative. So that is an amendment to the charge. Okay. <laughs> a, a member of the town council, uh, any, any, any member, and a, particularly a member from the town council finance committee, a representative from the school committee, a representative from the library trustees, and a resident citizen representative. Is there a second? I'll second it, but then I have a question. Okay. Um, my, my question is, the original motion on the table was to refer this charge to a committee, and now we have a motion to amend the charge, so I guess I'm a bit confused. I may have done it out of order, but it seemed to me that there are too many things were being uh, referred to a committee, and you, I believe that your point that this was getting into substance was a very valid point. So that I thought it was better, um, and perhaps I should have waited till we got through that first motion, that we, in fact, formed a committee, we, we had set the members here, and then referred it to the committee for whatever formatting and final touches and consistency was needed. As clarifying, was that four people that Dorothy listed? Five. Five. So there's a town council person and then a town council person from finance? Correct. Okay. I just, I just didn't know whether there was yeah. one town council person or two. Two, two town council and the total number of five. I mean, it just seemed that this was something that had been devised. I looked at it. It seemed like a reasonable solution. And I think we have to, we have to start moving forward a little bit faster. Okay, so we have a motion before us to, um, we, the, we actually never put the other motion in, in, okay. We have never put the other one in motion yet. So we're looking at a charge, we have a motion to amend the charge that's before us. Um, so, the, and the amendment would make, would change the membership of the body to be um, a town councilor, a town councilor from the finance committee, uh, somebody from the library trustees, a person uh, from the school committee, and a resident. And I'm assuming that the other bodies, meaning the school committee and the library, would appoint their own person. Correct. And the resident would be appointed by? Outreach. They, they don't make appointments. Town council makes appointments. Right. Okay, town so in council. other words, it would not be made by the town manager. Yes. So does, would we be changing whether this is a standing committee of the council then? It, we would. So it would, now be a committee of the town that then brings in that the town manager does the appointments technically? Um, and thus we bring, begin the confusion. <laughs> yes, Alyssa. So when GOL has time to finish the charge situation, <laughs> We will stop calling things standing. That's what the problem is here. We're calling this standing. What we need to know is what was the intention. Was it intended to be a standing committee of the town council, which in other worlds everyone calls subcommittees, but for whatever reason we don't, um, or was it meant to be like the energy committee where the town manager is doing it? And so if that's true, then I think the standing just refers to the fact that it's not something that's a working group that's doing one task and then disbanded. 
It's an ongoing thing. It doesn't have to be that way. It has been in the past sometimes just like, oh, who wants to do it? Okay, good. And then it was time to do it. And then they didn't do anything until the next time they needed to do it. So it doesn't really technically have to be a standing committee unless Mr. Steinberg thinks that would be a big improvement over what we used to do. But I think that's where we're getting confused is, the, is it our committee? That word standing is just causing us problems. And the, the way the charge is presented to you before the amendment was proposed is as a standing committee of the council. Mr. Balcom. So um, I drafted this charge and, and there's no requirement for there to be a committee uh, under the mm -hmm. charter. It just says that the council shall, the council shall cause to, for there to be an audit, and that you shall receive the audit. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in the past, you know, Mr. as um, Mr. Steinberg I think explained, there was all these other members on it. But since it's the council's responsibility for the audit, that's why I had originally had it right. one way, and then switched it to the main only councilors because it is your responsibility <coughs> ultimately, um, and. Uh, so, in terms of using the word standing, that was done purposely uh, because it is a standing committee of the council. And if you want to change it, the composition of the council, then you might would you look at the form of the of the um, of the charge and change that as well. So there's no requirement for there to be a committee. You don't have to create one, but I think that it's wise to create one because you want to have some group of people who are going to engage with the auditor. Um, to review the work of the of the executive side of the of the of the right. government, so town manager should not be appointing people to this committee. Right, right. Town manager should not be sitting on the committee. It really should be something uh, of the council. Right, right. And I mean, it, let me just add because I've not only served on audit committees but chaired audit committees. Um, the is sometimes audit committees are completely divorced from finance committees by recommendation of auditing, and other times they are actually part of finance committees, and I've served in both capacities. So just to further confuse things. Mandy Jo. So I wanted to address Alyssa's um, point of the charge. The GOL committee has come up with a preliminary draft charge that line will eventually read either standing or ad hoc or something dash committee of the town or committee of the council to make it clear. Um, we would take care of that at a referral to, to GOL if this charge comes to GOL as a technical matter. That draft charge template is set to be voted on this Wednesday morning and once it is it will fully be distributed to the entire town council. Um, it has already been distributed to um, the clerk and the town manager and the committee that was dealing with the economic development draft charge so they could work with it pending changes. Um, I do, and then to comment on the committee of the council, I think it could remain a committee of the council. I was just questioning whether it was intended that way. If it is, then the charter provides for the president appointing all the members, you might be able to say upon recommendation by the school committee or something of the school committee members or things like that, um, but that the formal appointment would fall through the town council president per the charter. There's a motion on the floor um, to change the membership of the committee. I'm going to call the question, if there's no further discussion, I'm going to call the question on that motion, and then we'll go back to the original motion, or the original idea. So call the question on the motion to make the committee have a membership of one member from the town council, one member from the finance committee who is a town councilor, one member from the library trustees, one member from the school board, um, of course, school committee, school board committee, and uh, one resident. Um, all those in favor, signify, signify by saying aye. Oh.
Oh, it was a vote and seconded, right? So now what I'm asking all those in. Right, all those in, in favor, raise your hand. <laughs> Opposed? Abstain. Do you need more time? Okay, go back. All those in favor? Opposed? Abstain. Steve Dorsey. Okay. Andy, Kathy. All right. So we're back to the original motion, which is to refer this to the Rules of Procedure Committee, right? No, I wanna make sure I got that right. No, the following, no, excuse me. I totally forget what I just said. Here is the motion, and I'm making it now as a motion to refer the Audit Committee charge to the Governance Organization and Legislation Committee. Is there a second? Sarah, Sarah. further conversation. All those in favor? Opposed? Abstain? Two, Darcy and Kathy. Okay. We are, that was the timer. Uh, we are now moving on to appointments. There are none, and committee reports. And I just, uh, Sarah, I'll start with you. I know you've submitted a written report. Thank you. Yeah, and um, so Darcy is going to be giving our report tonight. Okay, Darcy. Um, yes, this will be short. Um, we just submitted a a memo about our meeting that Sarah and I had with the town manager and two of the community participation officers. And um, the, the reason for the memo was just to give guidance to counselors uh, about um, just giving them information about the community participation officers and their availability to assist us with our district meetings um, uh, and other information about their availability, et cetera. So I'm not gonna go through all of that because you can just read it in the packet, um, but it was just sort of a service to the counselors to give them more information about setting up your meetings. Okay, questions at this time of that committee? Andy, do you have an oral report from finance? Yes, I will be brief. Uh, when the finance committee last met, um, our major time was spent um, hearing Mr. Mangano's presentation and because um, we were aware that it would be presented again tonight to the full council, we decided that a written report was really not going to be particularly helpful because uh, we thought that Mr. Mangano would speak for himself. Um, the committee is meeting tomorrow, and I think that the, uh, and it's at two o'clock in this room, and uh, the major portion of the work will be to really delve into the question of the committee's goals and work plan for the remainder of this year um, and to explore questions on budget information materials uh, that um, would be helpful for the committee to complete its work. Um, so we will be back to you with a written report probably at the next meeting explaining what our proposed process is and how it will fit into the council schedule as a whole. Um, and as an example of that, I will um, 
explain something that goes into Saturday's meeting, uh, the four towns meeting. The um, charter does provide that if there is good legal reason to do so, this isn't the exact word, that we can, um, as a council, take up a portion of the budget at a different time. And um, we will be discussing um, whether to take up the regional schools at a time that coincides with um, the other three towns um, having their annual town meetings at which they will adopt the budget in part because um, the uh, rules, the state law that um, governs regional schools provides that once it has been adopted by three towns, then the fourth town is bound um, to it. So we would be committed forevermore to the budgets adopted by the other three towns if we don't take that action ourselves to participate in the process at the same time that the other towns are doing so. So that will be um, part of the discussion that we will be having tomorrow and incorporating into our report at the next meeting. And uh, we will also probably continue the discussion um, that Mr. Rangano started tonight and uh, continue to be working on that um, so that we can make sure that the information that we as a council need for making our decision on April 1st is available to us. Thank you. Questions? Mandy Jo, Governance Organization Legislation Committee. So we're still working on the template, as I said. Um, we hope to have something finalized this week. Um, we are also working on guidelines for how the Governance Committee will review items for clarity, consistency, and actionability that we're working on creating a document for that. We've discussed the guidelines and we'll be discussing the document that we can then pass out and, and circulate to people, um, not just the council, but others so that they know, have some idea of what our review will, will be like. Um, as the report said, the GOL committee took a vote and voted to not recommend referring the resident advisory committee charge back to this council that it took a vote to say that charge does not belong in front of the council so it is not going to be referred back out to the council from our committee it was sent straight back to the town manager for him to format his charge under the temporary preliminary charge template um, for establishing of the council of the commission um, and the reasoning is in that, that memo. Um, so that's it right now. Questions? Yes, Kathy. Yeah, in reading the report, it looks like you're considering going to every one of the committees that exists beyond the council committee and asking them to reformat their, will that come to us as a recommendation? Because I, I I've gone and looked at them and I realize that they're all over the place in terms of the way they write it, but I find all of them clear and it would be a lot of work to format them into a specific and they might end up rewriting. <laughs> so I'm just wondering, is that going to, you're going to look at that and then it's, is it going to come as a recommendation to us? So the committee is discussing whether to make a recommendation to the council that the council request that town committees relook at their charges and reformat them themselves into the template so that it's not falling on staff or on the council committees to do all of that reformatting. <coughs> we were charged with coming up with a template and so we will be discussing how we want council how we want town committees and council committees to get their charges into that template and so yes if whatever that however that discussion resolves itself or wherever that discussion leads, the implication at this point is that it would be a referral back to this body to make, that it would be a recommendation from the GOL to this body to then this body act on whether that is something that we want committees to do or not. Um, 
And this is this all committees, all 90 of them, or just the standing committees and we, the ones that we've done? We haven't actually had the discussion yet, so I can't speak as to how broad or not that recommendation may or Thank may you. not be. Thank you. Any further questions? Yes, Darcy. I would just like to add to what Kathy said that um, that it's it's a concern to me that um, that the committees would be asked to do this reformatting. That's number one. Uh, just because I I feel like um, we are doing a lot of work, and I I feel there's a definite weariness factor. <laughs> at about this time. And um, not only would all of the committees be required to uh, do this additional work, but then all of, the, all of it would come back to us. And this would take up our council time to be just looking at whether or not we approve a template from all of these different committees. It, it seems like, I guess I feel like we need to be thinking about what types of things are truly necessary for us to do and uh, try to eliminate as much as possible <coughs> the make work um, and the types of things that aren't necessarily going to help in fulfilling our <coughs> mandate as a council. Um, the other thing I was concerned about is the fact that the the Resident Advisory Committee um, charge was sent to the town manager. Um, that, seem, that feels to me like a substantive decision on the part of that committee um, and something that should have come to the council as a recommendation rather than the committee making a substantive decision like that on its own because it seems like a big decision to me, a substantive decision. Are there further comments? Alyssa. So assuming this is just being given in the spirit of not going to your GOL meeting, so have fun there. And these are the things we're just telling you because you'll hear them when you come back otherwise. Is associated with the RAC, I totally get that that is the town manager's charge and if he chooses to use our format or not or whatever he chooses to do is fine because the charter makes it clear that's his committee and that's not subject to confirmation. At the same time, OCA is very concerned about what the role of the Resident Advisory Commission is because it makes a big difference as to what we feel like the process is for appointments. And so if that committee is actually evaluating applicants, which is what it says in the charter, that's a whole different situation than if they're just doing outreach. And so it's true that we don't control what the charge says, but if the committee that's going to be bringing appointments back to the town council doesn't know who else has been involved in the appointment process, then we're not giving you adequate information because we don't have adequate information to work from. So if they didn't exist, that would be one kind of process. But they exist, assuming they exist, whatever role they play, if it actually follows what it says in the charter, which I don't believe it can based on open meeting law, but if it did or if it doesn't, we at Outreach Communications and Appointments need to know what it is in order to explain how we brought you appointments to act on because that's part of the process. So I get that GL's like, hey, it's not our charge, it's, it's his charge, but I, we need to figure out some way of making that connection back to the appointments process so that we have that situation. And then separately, completely separately on charges, I don't think we have a thing to say to the 40 odd committees that are multiple member bodies about what their charges should look like. I think that the, in terms of, that we have no say on what their charge documents look like. And so I think it would be a great idea if governance said, we think this looks good. We, we like this new thing. We feel like we've addressed a bunch of stuff because we wrestled with all these issues when we were trying to figure out what to call things. And so we think this looks like a pretty good format. 
would you like to use it? What do you think of it? Because, you know, actually, they've all been doing work of committees. We haven't been. They have been. And many of them haven't looked at their charge in five years and, or longer. And so I don't want them to rewrite unless they want to. Um, so I guess I'd look at it as more of a, hey, we came up with this cool thing that we think was pretty great. You might want to use it too. But, and even maybe get some feedback from them, how it might or might not work for them but I don't really feel like it's appropriate for us to be telling bodies we don't even appoint how they should be running their charge documents. Hopefully we just learned from the best of those what we think looks good in our charge documents. Further comments? Dorothy. Uh, Dorothy. Here, here. <laughs> Are there any further comments? I feel like, first of all, the um, format for charges has not been brought forward, so we're not in any position to have a further conversation about that. However, um, the committee has referred back to the town manager, the resident advisory committee, but there does seem to be some ongoing um, question as to its role and its relationship to the Outreach Communications and Appointments Committee. Um, so I'd be interested in hearing counselors' um, thoughts on that and Mr. Bockelman's. Sarah. So as Alyssa stated, I think as, as far as for outreach and communications and appointments, I just think if, if the town manager has an idea, you know, this is his committee, if he has an idea of how he, act, what he thinks the role is, and it, it would help us to then know what our role is. Paul? Thank you. So I have had that conversation with um, certain counselors. Um, in terms of the residence advisory committee, there isn't a lot of direction in the charter. It's a basically a, a one sentence thing. And uh, the way I envision it is um, that the, um, there, it's not the um, public participation, the community participation officer's role that they're augmenting. It's really designed, in my mind, the way I read it, to assist the town manager in making appointments or referencing appointments. Um, consider that uh, you may have a new town manager who doesn't know the community as well <coughs> and would want to talk to other people about making appointments. There's an important responsibility for the town manager to make appointments. So the residence advisory committee would be in the, in, uh, able to advise, it's an advisory committee, um, on what those, uh, who would serve well on which committees? Because it's, it's, it's sometimes it's a chess game, as you know, or not chess game, but you're a puzzle trying to figure out who serves well on which committee and who works well together, that type of thing. And that this is someone, a group of people, who um, would be useful to have that conversation with. Um, and I think that that's, you know, I'm happy to come to an OCA meeting anytime uh, if I'm invited and um, to engage in that, this type of conversation. Uh, some people perceive the Residence Advisory Committee as an outreach arm. I don't. I see that as being the job of, I mean, the, the counselors are doing a tremendous amount of outreach. I think that the, um, you know, the uh, part, community participation officers are doing a tremendous amount of outreach. Um, and uh, I see this as more as a consultation and um, a vetting process for the appointments and having that conversation um, with the town manager about are your appointments uh, aligned with the requirements of the charter. The charter lists a couple of different things that the town manager is supposed to take into account when making appointments. Um, and so our, and it sort of as a testing mechanism for the town manager before those get uh, relayed to the council for confirmation. Pat. Um, one of the things I've been concerned about is um, uh, diversity in appointments to all committees and so um, it feels important to me um, that we are aware of um, who applies uh, what happens 
um, you know, are people of color, I'm not saying this is true, but are people of color being rejected even if they have extra speed, uh, expertise or no, there's too many mothers out front people so we can't have more. You know, what are the assumptions and how do we know the assumptions of the residents who are going to be advising you? And I have a personal experience with someone uh, I'm close to being rejected from a committee, not in your tenure, but uh, she, uh, at the time she was working for the Institute of Community Economics, um, and uh, which did a lot of land trust work. She was being um, wanting, they wanted to bring her on to planning. Um, and at the discussion of her application, uh, one committee member said, oh, she sounds like she has an agenda. And so she was never interviewed or anything else. And the only reason she knows that is because the guy who asked her to be on the committee was there and related. So I'm not saying that's what you're doing or any committee is doing right now, but it's a concern um, and an ongoing concern because Amherst doesn't always live up to its professed values. I'm, I'm going to suggest that um, the Outreach Communications and Appointments Committee um, take the town manager up on his offer to have this conversation and that um, if other counselors are interested, they obviously can go to observe um, and um, behave accordingly. <laughs> okay. All right. Yes, uh, Alyssa. And to further entice you to consider looking at our meetings, let's understand that we have at this point, as much as we've been, we've been working especially hard on process that you heard already that I was frustrated by um, because we're not going to get to do what we want associated with planning board and ZBA. But in terms of all our confirmation of town manager appointments, we have zero information at this point as to how that's going to work. We have zero information on what we'll be able to tell you associated with demographics, on what we'll be able to tell you about the possible pool, on why individual people were chosen, which is one of the reasons we wondered what the role of the RAC was actually going to be since the words in the charter say evaluation and selection of candidates. That is different than here's an, some advice of some organization to talk to about possible candidates. It says evaluation and selection. So it, it is very much a work in progress. And so thoughts that you have can be shared with us individually or you know sent or come to our meeting because I know you all don't have enough meetings to go to. Mm -hmm. But we're just actually not ready yet because we don't have enough information to know yet. Okay. Um, I'm going to suggest we move on. Um, Dorothy, Steve, or one of the other four co-chairs um, of the Community and Economic Development Committee uh, charge ad hoc. I'm sorry, I missed rules of procedure. Alyssa? Surprisingly, we're adding liaisons and finance committee resident appointments to our meeting next week. Anything else? Okay. Dorothy, you're um, speaking for yes. the committee tonight. Yes. I'm giving a very brief report. Uh, we met twice. We uh, came to agreement on a revised charge, which you will get uh, in a few days. And one of the major things that we did do was to um, suggest a change name of the committee um, because of something that we're envisioning in the future. We are changing it, rec recommending the change uh, from committee and economic development to the Community Resources Committee because we strongly feel, although economic development is very much an important part of the uh, purview of this committee, that there needs to be a uh, multi-member town committee on economic development, which would include uh, non-counselors. So, um, and there was some research done by committee members uh, of what's done in other towns, and this committee name is used, I believe, in Northampton for the same committee. So, um, that's really the committee, except that we wanted to strongly say, the report, that's that we wanted to have a town-wide uh, economic development committee formed, and that the new Community and Resources Committee, we hope to get in action soon. And that is actually scheduled for the March 4th meeting for that charge. 
Uh, the bylaw review committee has no report at this time. I'm sorry, questions. You'll have to just excuse me. I'm kind of like, <laughs> you know, a little foggy tonight. Um, so I'm trying to en envision this. This committee, uh, the ad hoc committee, is just putting forth a charge right. for the council committee, but it will be accompanied by a recommendation that someone, but not this committee, also draft a charge for a new committee of the town that will be an economic development committee. Is that what I'm hearing? That sounds Okay. Yeah. So we can expect that there'll be yet another committee, for, another ad hoc committee formed to form another committee in the near future? <laughs> yes, it, but it, it, would, it would not be formed by this committee. Mandy, Joe. So my, my question was on a similar but slightly different line, although Evan brings up a different point, which is would such a drafting fall under GOL or not? Um, this is one of the things that GOL is struggling with in some of its conversations as to what our charge actually is. Um, so it'd be good to hear from the council about things like that. But my next question was, is this charge, since we were given other charges to review, including one tonight, does this charge come to GOL before it comes back to the council? And if so, will we have it in time for this Wednesday's meeting at 1030 so that maybe it could be acted on by the, on the 4th? I, um, um, ask Kathy. Um, we, when, when it's, submitted to the council, we put it in the format that you gave us. You know, we followed it exactly, even with a footnote filled out on it. So I think we changed it enough from the last charge that people saw. It would be good for people to first look at the content and then refer it, you know, to say, do you like, because we were asked both what's the scope and what exactly will it do were the two big questions. So the rest of it could then go, I, I just think you're going to want to look at what we wrote up as a group and say, you kind of like it or, or something else. Um, you're meeting on Wednesday morning? Yes. We, we also have a scheduled meeting for Wednesday, March 6th. So we, we could discuss this charge on March 4th, take a vote on March 4th to refer it and and GOL can just go ahead and put it on our okay. agenda for March 6th. Okay. All right. So GOL has a, a entire year-long schedule of meetings now that was actually, I believe, attached to the report that is in our packet. Okay. Um, so we will proceed with discussing particularly the substance of the charge and any other issues around the charge on our next meeting. And then if it needs to be referred to GOL, it will be, but it may not need to be. Yes, Alyssa. So just to follow up on how that was kind of a two-part issue is, so the charge for the actual committee that we've been discussing various mm -hmm. iterations of, that's coming back to the council on Monday and then might very well be referred and could already be added to the list of topics for GOL for the sixth. But their mm -hmm. other recommendation that's going to be accompanying that would that then be a secondary referral? And, and so are we getting a two-part thing on Monday or are we only getting a, and someday we should be doing this other thing or are we actually getting a two-part thing on Monday? And the reason I ask that is because if we're getting a two-part thing, I just cannot emphasize strongly enough to please find out why the TCRC failed and why we don't use the EDIC before you just come up with a brand new charge for an economic development committee. Okay. You're not getting the second committee recommendation. Um, it was just that in terms of the name, we thought about that this committee would probably come into being relatively soon, and it would be very confusing for townspeople to have an economic development committee and a community and economic development committee. So that's why we did the name change. Um, okay. If you need to have me read the items that, it, that we proposed it cover, I could do that, or you could wait to we'll get wait it in package. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, anything else on that ad hoc committee? 
All right, bylaw review. There's no report at this time. Pat? We could tell you quickly we've had our first meeting and we reviewed the work of the previous committee and what their uh, guidelines were. We set up a meeting schedule and we're ready to begin work soon, this Friday, I believe. Great. And your chair is Bob Ritchie? Not been decided yet. Yeah, we're going to be collaborative. Huh? Yeah, it hasn't been decided yet. And, and, and Pat, I don't want you to see this as a correction, but when we say meeting schedule, it, it's not like GOL's meeting oh, no. schedule. <laughs> we, we were able to find two times to meet, like out of forever, okay. because right. this is starting to get tough. Fine. This is starting to get tough in terms of all the commitments we yes. all have. Thank so you. I'm impressed that you came up with a year long schedule. Okay. Any further conversation on that? Thank you. Um, we have approval of minutes. Um, I move to approve the February 6th, 2019 Station Road Bridge Funding Public Forum. Is there a second? Hmm? Second. You got a second. George got his hand up first. George is the second in this case. Are there questions, corrections? You've seen these. We've given you an opportunity to edit them in the past. Anything else? Questions, corrections, changes? Seeing none, call the question. All those in favor are approving the minutes for February 6, 2019. First, the Station Road Bridge Funding Public Forum. That is... All those in favor? Okay. There's 12 and then one abstain, which is Ms. Brewer. Um, I move to approve the minutes of the February 6, 2019 Station Road Bridge funding approval and orientation to town departments. Is there a second? Second, Pat. Comments, corrections, changes? All those in favor? And that is all but Steve and you're abstaining and Alyssa abstaining, okay? And the minutes of February 11th, 2019, I move to approve them. Is there a second? Second. Mandy Jo, changes, yes. One thing I didn't catch till I was rereading them this afternoon. Uh, page two, public comment. Uh, the third public commenter, Mr. Hockman, uh, 51 Arnold Road. If I could pose an amendment to add Pelham, um, because that address is in Pelham. That is um, correct. And I think it's important to note. And he did make that point when yes. he introduced himself. So, okay. Consider that a friendly amendment. Um, is there any other changes, corrections? Okay, uh, all those in favor? Opposed? Huh? You weren't, you weren't here? Oh, abstain. Okay, two, Darcy and Elizabeth abstained. Um, any, okay. Uh, town manager's report, Paul, highlights. Thank you. Um, you have my report, and I want to start off by um, actually thanking the council for the amount of time and effort uh, you've been putting into taking on this important task. I think you've sort of already referenced the amount of efforts that you're, um, how hard it's starting to get to schedule things. Um, but uh, we have more coming up. So uh, tonight you had your SharePoint training. Next week we are inviting you, or the Musani Center is inviting you for a, a tour of the Musani Center. You would meet at the Musani Center, um, which is across the street in the lower level of the Bangs at 5.30. Totally volunteer if you'd like to, to take that tour or not. Um, and, uh, and then next up is once the weather changes, we'll, we want, we would, request the opportunity to give you tours of, of facilities for the town. I think that would be, it's really important. Our staff would be very excited to give you the tours, but we don't want to do that until we, we're beyond the, the bad weather. 
Um, our, my next cup of joe, this is not on here, but will be on Friday the 15th, I think, um, looking to go to Atkins with Fire <coughs> Chief Nelson. Um, monitor, continuing to monitor the events at Hampshire College uh, and uh, recognizing that whatever happens there will have an impact on the town and um, being engaged and as best we can as a community uh, in the um, decisions that they make uh, on their campus. Um, Board of License Commissioners uh, had their second meeting uh, today, and they seem to be working. They're very, it's a very engaged group. They've put a lot of time in as they are educating themselves and um, taking action, approving licenses and things like that. Um, the, uh, I want to mention the community participation officers. So, you know, I, this continues to be a work in progress. Uh, they are meeting at least twice a week, communicating with each other, thinking about how they can be involved, uh, wanting to get more feedback from the council and um, ex exactly what, how they can best serve you. Um, you know, we've had discussion today about the district meetings, what their capacity is for engaging in that, uh, and, uh, and what role you want them to play in terms of um, how much organization, whether you need people in attendance or not, that types of thing. So we wanna have that as a conversation in terms of how you would like uh, to engage staff, and we've had this conversation a bit. Um, it's an important conversation because you're all, or at least 10 of you, are responsible for having district meetings at least twice a year, and we want to make sure that we kind of standardize what the, expect, what the expectations from staff is, um, and there are lots of different ways to do that, so I think we, we're looking forward to having that kind of conversation uh, probably with the OCA committee when the time comes that, that they're ready to have that conversation. But in the meantime, you know, as best we can for the district meetings, we'll support those. Um, it's a, and um, we've had some conversations about different ways to um, um, engage staff um, in your district meetings or in other venues that might be something other than your district meetings. Open to it, whatever thoughts you have on that. Um, they have been uh, working on your on the website. A focus has been on the town council it, website itself to try to bring that uh, into an acceptable form so that people who are interested in town council activities, which I think is generating a lot of interest in the town, can find the information they need as easily as possible. So to that end, we've created a separate calendar just for town council. Uh, events and for your individual office hours and meetings and people will be able to subscribe to that and if they want to just say they just want to follow what's happening with the council and not have to do anything else with the rest of the town boards they can do that um, trying to get your committee structure um, online to be uniform so that all the committee's spaces look the same um, Margaret, as you heard tonight, uh, if you're here for the SharePoint training, is working very hard with Sean, with others, about getting our processes in place <laughs> and sh figuring out how SharePoint fits into our public, our, our, our need to put material on the website and making sure our internal processes are in, are in shape um, and who's going to do all the work. And so we're, we're working through it pretty successfully, I think, but it takes time. And so if you can be patient with us and have suggestions for us, we're very open to those suggestions um, and trying to get this um, into a well-oiled machine, which is what all of our goals are. And the only, the only other thing that I want to mention, I think, um, was uh, this Saturday you will have your four towns meeting at the high school. Typically it's at the middle school, uh, but it will be at the high school in the cafeteria. Um, and so that is scheduled from 9 to 10.30. Uh, we will post that as a council meeting, but on top of that, uh, it is the, um, the weekend that is known for having parties. Uh, and so that's where we typically work, for, we would typically stage at the middle school. So if you go to middle school, you'll see a lot of police cruisers and that's where everybody comes, they get their, their instructions and things like that. So that's why the meeting had to be moved to the high school. Um, so in terms of, you'll, you'll see a heavy pre presence of police officers um, from various communities standing on street corners, just having a heavy pre just presence, being there, 
uh, helping people um, do what they want to do, but be responsible about it and making sure our, all residents are being safe. Um, a lot of planning has gone into that. Um, so hopefully that will um, go off well. The big determinant in how, what happens on that day is typically the weather. And the weather looks to be not so good, which is great news. <laughs> so that concludes my report. Okay. All right. Thanks for the weather report. Um, <laughs> town council comments. Um, I really have nothing else to add at this point, unless people have questions. Yes. I don't have a question, uh, but I want to talk about agenda items. Yes. Um, I uh, recently got a call from uh, one of the members of the housing author um, committee, uh, and they were concerned to get the East Street proposal when it was coming up on the agenda. And I realized I had no idea. And I contacted Lynn and I got the information. But one of the things I was realizing is, while I can't set the agenda, it would be really helpful to know what's in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and that doesn't put yes. onus on you to schedule it my way or something. Yeah. But I really would like to know what's there. Thank you, and I, I totally agree with that. And uh, I contacted Paul at that point uh, to understand the status of the application, and that will either be on the agenda on the 4th or the 18th. Probably the 18th is what Paul's saying. Um, another item under future agenda items, this comes out of a email exchange that I had with Kathy, and that is we'd like to ask Doug Slaughter to come at some point and talk about transportation. Now, if he'd like to talk about the Board of License Commissioners, <laughs> he's more than welcome to. Perhaps he'd like to give us a, some reflections of its first moments. Mm -hmm. but yes. So I did speak to him today, and he's prepared at your convenience to be here. Okay. Okay. Yes. Um, one of our alert viewers, when Guilford Morin was giving his presentation, notified a number of us that um, while Guilford talked about the way that construction services are procured as being designed, bid, built, Massachusetts has enabled another way, which is construction manager at risk, which in some ways is a, um, a possibly a better way if you're dealing with complicated building types such as a high performance buildings. So it doesn't, it doesn't affect the work of the council directly, at least at this point, and it's sometime off in the future, but it should be noted that there is another way of procuring um, construction services, chapter 149A, if you're keeping score at home, which is construction manager at risk, and it means procuring the services of the contractor through a qualification-based selection process same way the architect is selected. Okay. Yes, yeah, Alyssa. So to briefly follow up on that, is that the one that gets the write-ups about how it actually didn't end up saving anybody money that they thought it was going to save them? Because that could be one point associated with that. That came up with some school projects. But it is worth knowing that there are multiple ways of doing it. And I thought he'd touched on that, but thank you. The other thing, completely unrelated, is from the town manager's report associated with the North Amherst Library. And just in terms of managing our constituents' expectations, it says there are three options. This will be in a future capital plan. It doesn't say which of the three options will be in a future capital plan. And it doesn't really indicate if it'll be this year or 10 years from now. So I'm just wondering if that's something we can, if we want to manage because JCPC will talk about it and then it'll come here. But it's just something that obviously District 1, where I happen to live, is talking about a lot and they're planning to have a meeting focused on it soon. And so it's an interesting situation we find ourselves in if it's, you know, it's not really something that's for the town council to talk about yet because it'll be a capital planning process, but to understand, so that, again, so we can manage expectations, because saying a three option thing will be in a future capital plan is maybe, I don't want people to assume too much. Andy, Andy do you want to speak to the issue, since you're also chairing JCPC? 
Uh, yes, and I guess I'll do a disclosure really quickly because it, uh, as uh, was done previously, uh, my <coughs> wife is an employee of the um, library system and works at the North Amherst Library. However, um, I don't believe that that creates a conflict for uh, the question of looking at the capital plan. Uh, the joint capital planning committee will um, ha has been developing 10-year plans. I think that it is our um, inclination to continue to develop 10-year plans, which is uh, longer than specified in the charter, but the charter sucks. But really in terms of a minimum. Um, and uh, so I think that we will have to talk about where that place is in, but it gets back into the presentation that you previously heard from Mr. Mangano. And uh, so I think that the JCPC will be taking that up. I just don't know how quickly we will be able to do that because we have to work th through the other uh, processes that are in place and see where they fit in before we can start talking about placing another um, significant project. And the same will be true for people who are asking about um, Senior Center and some other uh, proposals that have been out there for a long time also. Okay. Yes, Darcy. I have uh, just one more suggested agenda item, and I'm <clears throat> just referencing Tim Holcomb's email from yesterday. Um, this, might <clears throat> this might be something we could, uh, <clears throat> I can't talk. <clears throat> uh, this might be something we could put on as a very um, quick resolution on one of our meetings to support um, the legislation that would change the state seal that's been, um, oh, thank you, <laughs> um, supported by uh, our two le state legislators and uh, might be something we could do at the beginning of a meeting during the resolutions and proclamations. Um, it was a, an email that we got yesterday uh, with a recommended resolution in it. Possible that not everybody got that. Yeah, to clarify, I think five counselors received that, the three at large and the two district five counselors. Oh, okay. All right. Could Sorry. you please forward it to me? Sure. Thank you. Um, the, um, are there any other items? I do know that we have one other resolution coming up next week, and it's regarding the Tibetan um, a resolution, right? And Alyssa and I attended the event on Sat what day was that? Saturday? Saturday, and it was just lovely. And they really honored Jim McGovern, who has played a large role in uh, the filing of legislation regarding uh, Tibet and trying to restrain China, frankly. Uh, so um, are there any other comments or questions from counselors? Any other items not reasonably anticipated? None on my part. No executive session. Do I hear a motion? Yes. <laughs> wait, wait a minute. What time is he listed for? Hold on. Hold on. Steve. Steve, 9.58. You already missed yours. Steve. <laughs> okay. What is it, Steve, that you think we skipped over? We didn't? Okay. You sure? Okay. Um, please let me know, by the way, if, the, if there is a change in your plans to attend any of the school events because... Uh, you will be recognized and introduced by the facilitators at the beginning of the event. Um, and also, please carefully read 
the somewhat lengthy email I sent earlier since we spent a lot of time getting both opinions from Paul and Margaret on our attendance at these meetings and our kind of do's and don'ts. Uh, and also, um, I spent some time with Anastasia Ordinez uh, making sure I understood what the flow of the program would look like. And um, we're, they're really looking forward to our participation. So, do I hear a motion to adjourn? Is there a second? second? Sarah, all those in favor? Let the record, oh, opposed. <laughs> okay, let me say that the person who won tonight's lottery is, well, it's a toss up between Evan and Dorothy. Um, Evan, it's closer to 10.15. You get it this time. I think I said 11. Did you? Oh, you're right. Yeah. Oh, it's definitely Evan. 